Okay. Go on. All right. Well, good morning, yeah, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all the participants in this seventh symposium. Um, the symposium is uh, titled ICF, uh, sorry, celebrating 20 years of ICF Quo Vadis. So celebrating the past and looking forward. Today we'll be um, looking at the past and current and tomorrow we'll be looking forward to the next phase of ICF. So the mm -hmm. outcomes of the symposium, we'll have some recommendations and actions for collaboration and with the uh, presentations are being recorded and those will be put onto the um, ICF education portal in due course. So with, um, I hope you've all received the, the agenda. First, this morning, we'll be looking, taking stock of ICF for the past two decades. And with that, I'll ask Matilda Leonardi from it, the Italian Collaborating Center for the World Health Organization Family of International Classifications. Uh, she will introduce us, give a brief introduction to herself and then she'll be speaking on the ICF and the WHO Disability Assessment Schedule around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you so much. Uh, I am a neurologist. I've been working on ICF since 1995 from ICDH-80. So most of my professional life has been working on ICF. I work at the National Neurological Institute but uh, my public health hat is very much devoted to the development and implementation of ICF and who does around the world so far. And I am very pleased and I thank you, the organizers for inviting me to speak about today, particularly Eduardo and all his team for organizing this important moment of our ICF summary, let's say uh, about its use. And I thank you all the colleagues from the ICF education group that have been organizing, despite the difficult situation, this important meeting. And if you agree, then I will share my screen and I'm going straight to my work. And uh, which I don't see now. I don't know what is happening. I'm sorry, I knew that it was going to happen like this. Ah, I'm sorry. Okay, try again. I did try before, but it didn't work. Okay, here is it. Yes. So, we are celebrating today 20 years of ICF, but something strange had happened in May 2001. As two devices were launched on the global market and both have changed the history, although each of them in different areas. The first one was the iPod. It was launched in May 2001, together with the other one, which is ICF. Both of them have been this year celebrating their anniversary. And in a sense, what the iPod Apple team was saying about iPod, I could also use for the ICF. It's a device first introduced in 2001. And they have since come out in different updates and types, such as ICF, CY, ICF 2017, 18, 20, as well with many related tools, ICF checklist, ICF core set, who does model disability form. Until now, more than 20 years, ICF has been translated in more than 65 languages, created an enormous value on the functioning and disability areas at the global level. And today and tomorrow, the SEF educating meeting speakers will take you back to the first SEF, to the next SEF. What will be there to see is what we're going to have. And funny enough, I will say this was what the iPod people were saying about iPod. However, despite the iPod has been knowing in the last 20 years, a lot of versions, at the end, it was only used to listen music. And that was the only aim of this iPod. While in a sense, this biopsychosocial model of ICF has been very much used for many more things. So despite they were born together, the SAF has been knowing in history of 
broadly views is based on its biopsychosocial model, which defines functioning disability as the interaction between a health condition and environmental factors. And this has been really revolutioning the world of uh, functioning and disability. And uh, as we all know, despite all the different classification, ICD-9, ICD-10, ICD-11 change, the ICF so far is the only instrument that WHO has been uh, developing to measure functioning and to classify functioning and disability. And uh, it has been sort of paired by other instruments. And uh, last year, we say bye-bye to the ICFCY, which was developed in uh, 2007 to complement with codes the areas of children. And after 13 years of services and before entering adulthood, the ICFCY disappeared. So that was a good instrument, which was now embedded in the ICF 2020 version. That is the one the WHO is trying to update, and that was released October 2020 last year. And uh, together with ICD and uh, ICHI, they are part of the uh, family of classification. And uh, in doing the uses of the ICF, we have also to go back to the history of what was planned for its use. The first paper on ICF possible uses, beside what it is written in the introduction of ICF, came out in 2003. It's a paper from Ustun, Chatterjee, and Bickenbach, and it was presenting this new tool for understanding disability and health. So that was, in a sense, the first message. We need to understand. And uh, this paper was immediately after the WHO release in May 2001. And it was sort of defining that what was listed in the ICF were all the possible uses. Already three years after ICF publication, there was a first review of what was ICF for. It was a review of Bruyere and colleagues, and then they found a wide variety of application already published and concluded that the results were encouraging. But as I say, three years after ICF, it was not clear, but most of the papers in the first year was, were trying to understand the meaning of ICF. So they were about what it is this new instrument telling us. So the first uses of ICF were in a sense culture, were not related to immediate application. 10 years after its publication, two major reviews came out that were trying to analyze all its possible uses. One was from Chernuskite and colleagues from my group, and the other was from the colleagues from Gelmas and the other. And they both concluded that studies applying ICF cosm to health, this was clear, the first areas of application, or discipline-specific management of patients were, in fact, the mostly sort of uh, um, published studies uh, of the use of ICF in the first 10 years, as well as together with the development of core sets, ICM, uh, ICF related items and other health conditions. However, in the first 10 years, non-clinical applications were emerging and they were including education, labor, policy, technology development, and also statistics. However, both authors overall uh, we're defining that after 10 years, we were in presence of a cultural change because of the growing spread of journals and topics covered. Still in the first 10 years, there was not so much use in statistics. That is why Nenad Konstajek from the WHO was making a push with one paper in which he was outlining that there was a big value of ICF for disability statistics and health information systems. And he, this was also a push related to the use of ICD. And he was also saying that a highlighting application like multi-country survey, national survey, and national data system were to be seen as possible areas of application of the ICF. At that time, we still didn't have ICD-11, which was in preparation. But it was clear that ICD-11 was going towards a direction in 2011, towards the direction of informatization. So the, it was very weak, still, the application in statistics. What happened in those years was also that in 2006, the UN Convention for the Right of People with Disability was by, published and ratified by the UN. And that was also pushing very much the use of ICF because uh, the UN Convention was the frame for policy development for all policies and for all stakeholders. But ICF has been considered since the publication of the UN Convention as the instrument to evaluate the implementation of the Convention, which is now in 2021 ratified in 175 countries 
Many of them want to use ICF either to monitor the implementation, to support changes in disability statistics or disability eligibility or in clinical. However, how to use it for many countries is still not so clear in terms of operationalization. What happened in 2013 was that it was published the practical manual. And that was the first detailed instrument that was showing how ICF is and can be used. Mainly the ICF practical manual was reiterating what was published in 2001, but with much more detailed intervention and areas for the ICF use. Clinical practice in which it was clear that ICF is very useful for health and functioning, setting goals, evaluating treatment outcomes, communicating with colleagues, and also complementary to ICD, helping to give a full picture of health. ICF should be used, and there were a lot of use cases, to support services and income support, particularly the eligibility assessment, which is now I'm going to speak in a minute, for population statistics. And uh, particularly, it was referring to a paper published in 2007 by Ross Madden on uh, building ICF as building block for statistical information in education. And there's been a lot of experiences. I want to mention here the experience of Italy that has been making a full national reform based on the ICF classification, as well as for many policies and programs in which out of them, advocacy and empowerment was very important because at that point, it was clear that many NGOs or people with disability around the world were in a sense, despite contesting a bit the ICF, because still consider in a sense, medical model using ICF for creating this common language between politicians and lay people, clinicians and uh, people in different areas and settings. 15 years after its publication, the ICF uh, was also revised by an intensive review done by Madden and uh, Bundy, in which they were saying that the ICF has made a difference to functioning and disability measurement and statistics. And what they were showing is that ICF stimulates common language and stimulates new thinking, but the fields needs to mature. What was clear is, in fact, that in many areas of statistics, uh, particularly, it was not clear by member states and by governments how to use real statistics and how in statistics the functioning elements should be embedded into the national way. In 2018 years after the publication, uh, a very important tool came out, the ICIF learning tool, which in a sense had to implement the use. And this was placed in the ICF uh, uh, education.com, which is the site where you have all the education material. But this one was uh, requested by the WHO and is now translated in several languages and it was developed by one of the two, I would say that the beginning of the work, three major collaborating centers is the Italian, the German and the Australian were those who were pushing a lot the implementation of ICF. Then others were coming, but the three major works that uh, you can uh, see in uh, the literature, but not only, even in the WHO report, were, were starting from these three countries, the German center, the Italian center, and the Australian center. Then all of them were joining, and uh, in the last years, a lot has been done. After 20 years, last year, it was uh, felt that there was the need to understand where and how ICF is used. This is why a global ICF use case questionnaire has been prepared by the FDRG, the WHO uh, group that is uh, in charge of the ICF, and was circulated. And uh, there was a request to the 45 uh, collaborating center of WHO to report which are the main users in their country. What came out is that several countries have been formally reported at governmental level, and uh, the questions about the use of ICF were several and uh, it was clear that uh, uh, sorry it was clear that many countries have embedded icf into the legislation so they have the word icf in many many legislation however in terms of practical application at national level the use is uh, less uh, done while uh, the field of research and other fields are really really active so if we change the use of icf from a top-down approach from to a bottom-up approach we will see that there are not formally collected from entities uh, several several entities that use icf for several scopes other who units rehabilitation health statistics emergencies as development goal and universal health coverage by other international organization the international labor office and the unicef 
by countries who do not have the collaborating center, by many, many scientific and uh, lay world societies and associations, Rehabilitation International, the World Physiotherapy and Occupational Therapy, European Federation of Rehabilitation Research, the World Federation of New Rehabilitation, the ISPRIM. And also many universities have been developing ICF courses, although they are not listed, and they're not all of them into the icfeducation.com, uh, let's say, summary. And uh, also the use of uh, ICF should be implemented because in the ICD-11, the WHO has placed chapter five, which is listing functioning codes. So all of this and the result of the survey are going to be in a uh, peer review paper that is going to be published in the next months, where together with the high Ling and Olaf Kraus de Camargo, who were the FDRG chairs, we are collecting contribution from all the FDRG members and we are going to produce this. The other instrument, and I'm going towards my end of presentation, is the HUDAS. 20 years of HUDAS. HUDAS, in a sense, was born even before the ICF, but then grew up in parallel with the ICF. And as many advantages that have been depicted, and in a sense, it's uh, practically a bit more used than the HUDAS, because it is used particularly in the disability eligibility and the disability assessment at country level. So far, in the uh, international benchmarking that I've been doing for looking at where the uh, HUDAS, uh, together with the ICF, is used for the disability assessment, it comes out that many more countries than those that are listed as WHO Collaborating Center are using ICF and HUDAS particularly for the disability uh, eligibility assessment, including in Germany, some insurance companies. I would say that the country that in my review comes out as the champion of the use of uh, HUDAS in the disability assessment so far is Taiwan. And uh, also it's followed by France. The others are doing great efforts. However, if I have to say which case study would you recommend, I'm recommending Taiwan, because it is one of the countries that has, although it's a small country with not so many inhabitants, but they use a methodology which is in fact paying back because they are now formally collecting information and making assessment using the ICF and ICF derived instruments. So the, this also is going to be published next year in another peer review journal, which is going to present all these different cases. However, the ICF is also present in many, many instruments of the WHO and uh, many guidelines and many training guidelines. And uh, it is in a sense uh, something that together with the WHO, we would like to bring into the WHO Academy that is now a new academy of the World Health Organization that is providing online courses for the world. And uh, this is why we would like to bring it in. There is one issue that most of the countries are not referring to WHO uh, ICF as the instrument for health. So you find, so we are missing also information because many countries are using ICF under the responsibility of ministries such as the Ministry of Social Affairs, the Ministry of Welfare, the Ministry of Employment and the Ministry of Education, which are not reporting to the WHO. This is why also it's an issue because we are missing many very useful information that would allow countries to see each other and really develop this uh, imp important common language. If we have to mention which are the key global strategies in which ICF is mentioned as a key instrument. One is the Rehabilitation 2030 strategy of the WHO. Other is the WHO decade of healthy aging. Then in the monitoring of the UN convention, as well as in the work that is now undertaken by several groups to define indicators to identify if universal health coverage is covered, as well as to set which are the indicators that show that the sustainable development goals are reached. And also it is a wide use of uh, ICF in the COVID and post-COVID case report form. Just to say that uh, in the COVID and post-COVID, uh, uh, a paper that came out from the functioning group, I would say, was highlighting since last year that what was missing in most of the countries was the idea of functioning. And uh, the biopsychosocial perspective was in this paper that I show up there, 
as uh, intended as one of the perspective that in case of emergencies would allow not to miss and not to left anybody behind because uh, all the chronic patients and all those who have chronic conditions have been affected particularly by the COVID in the case report form of the WHO, which I think is going then to implement the use of functioning. Uh, the section 25 is the section that is collecting elements on the long COVID patients, which present a lot of functioning problems. And we have been able to embed the HUDAS areas into the case report from WHO, which so far has been used by, has been collected more than 190,000 uh, uh, cases of uh, post-COVID people. So, so far, in fact, we will have, if you want, a section of functioning of all 190 cases. So uh, I would say that uh, I already mentioned this, but when we use ICF to monitor the universal health coverage, which is crucial because we want everybody to have access to care, the framework within the ICF can serve is what defines health in detail. And I would say that the introduction of the environment in this is somehow confusing, but it is also very helpful because sometimes you cannot do things for the health intended as body function and body structure, but you can always go on in changing some barriers into facilitators. So providing information on which facilitators we are able to put in place at national level is a good way to monitor the universal health coverage. So I'm coming to an end. And I have to say that if you see what the Apple is providing as new novelty for the iPod, in fact, they keep remaining with producing a higher technical device, but still to reproduce music in all its possible forms. They are going to launch the iPod Max model uh, that is launching a mark in the 20th anniversary of the iPod. But I would say that also ICF is marking its 20 year with something that is called the modernization of the ICF. Because this year, the WHO has been putting ICF completely online on the platform and interacting with the classification ICD and the classification of health intervention. So the future of ICF and who does? It's in fact being on this new platform that is going to be refined by the WHO with the latest version, which will allow many more users to go on with that. Of course, this work is the result of hundreds of people along these 20 years have been working on that. And all these people are passionate people working on their time, believing that health is a, a critical thing and I think that despite we come from so, so many countries, we have been able to create a common language. And uh, now the work is chaired by the two co-chairs, Thomas Maribo and Andrea Martinuzzi, together with Manu Yanes from Mexico. And they keep uh, preserving this. So chairs can change. And many chairs of this group have been changing along the 20 years. But the language has remained common. And this is what we speak. Thank you. Thank you, Matilda. You've raced through a huge amount of information in just 20 minutes when you have a, a, a little more time if you need it. Uh, can I ask if anyone has any questions for Matilda? And uh, if you have, please either put them in the chat or raise your hand. I was afraid I was too long, which is usually my usual defect. <laughs> For that once, was I was in time. After 20 years, finally, I made it. And <laughs> yes, very fast and, uh, and very furious. Well, I just had one question that came to mind as, as you were talking, and it was about the, um, the remit of the WHO is in health, but disability is spread across many um, government departments and how you might suggest that we reach disability responsible areas that are outside I, I, of the Institute yeah, of Health. Thank you for the question, because I think this is one point in which at the end of this two days conference, we should come to sort of a proposal or solution because why WHO is missing so many information from the use of ICF is not only because there is a bottom up approach or because we don't have collaborating centers in all the countries. It is also that sometimes countries are not dealing with ICF in the health sector while the World Health Organization is the uh, secretariat of ministries of health. And uh, this is sort of limiting the, so while it is clear that ICD it is used 
by Ministry of Health because they make the calculation of natality, morbidity, and mortality. It is not clear who is using ICF. So the targets at formal level, governmental level, for the use of ICF are many more because functioning is affecting many more ministries in all areas of life of a person. And this is something that I think we could think of how can we capture this use of functioning and this maybe other presenters can help with this because for me, this is a question given that uh, if we collect the information formally from the WHO, we are unable to escape from the issue that in many countries, in more than 170 countries, in fact, ICF, thanks also to the use of the UN Convention, entered into the language. So many ministries want to use of ICF. But UN Convention usually is not taken care of by ministries of health, is taken care of by ministries of welfare. So then the entry point, the Trojan horse for the ICF is the UN Convention, but UN Convention is not going to ministries of health and is going to ministries of social affairs or other ministries. So then it is where, or the organization of people with disability or wherever, but then it is where we have a gap that we need to define and to identify how we can overcome. Thank you, Matilda. And can I open it to, the, to responses from other people in other countries and how they feel that this, might, this issue might be addressed? collecting more comprehensive information on ICF and HUDAS use. Anyone? Okay, well, in which case we'll move on to Jerome. Uh, Matilda, if you can close your screen. No, because I have, I have the slides of Jerome on my, so we just go, go. on. <laughs> Good, excellent. Jerome, are you ready to go? I am ready to go, and actually she has precisely two slides, because uh, I don't have slides other than one slide, which I threw in. Oh, that one, you can bring it up if you don't mind. Uh, thank you. Um, let me just introduce myself, uh, not myself so much as uh, what I'm going to talk about, because um, uh, Catherine um, spoke as if uh, I would be talking about the past, and what I'm going to be talking about is very much the future. Um, so I'm not even going to be talking so much about the present. So uh, what I'm outlining today is actually um, how at the University of Lucerne we see the development um, of, uh, of the ICF. And actually, second caveat, I'm not going to be talking about the ICF. Um, from our perspective and the work that we've done in the, in the University of Lucerne with the core sets and the work on um, metrics and the rest of it, um, we understand ICF is uh, the uh, health information reference system, and in fact, the only game in town. So from our perspective, we look at ICF um, as a reference system for the collection of health information. Um, but what I want to talk about today is actually sort of the development of some of the key ideas, or one central idea in the ICF, which um, is not to our understanding, fully developed in the ICF. And so this uh, discussion now today is going to try to tempt your interest in how we see uh, the, the evolution, put it that way, the evolution of the key idea within the ICF, and that is the idea of functioning. So let me just give you um, uh, our motivation for this. Um, I'm going to, if I have time, end up with uh, our plans, which are um, something called LIFE, a very nice acronym called the Lucerne Institute for Functioning and Evaluation. So um, our future plans in the next decade and a half, and since I'm almost 75 years old, this will be handing off to the next generation. But I want to give you some idea of where we're going. So first of all, some stuff that we all know, just to give you some understanding of how our motivation is, uh, uh, how we are motivated in, um, in, in our work. Um, we notice, as everyone else has, WHO and UN, that there are two primary drivers for, for health care and health sciences in the 21st century. Those are drivers are demographic, in particular population aging, living longer, but as uh, my colleague Samath Chatterjee said, living longer with more disability. 
So the phenomena that we're looking at demographically is an increase in the burden of disease, the increase in disability, or as we prefer to call it, problems in functioning. Um, the other is epidemiological, and that is to say increased prevalence of NCDs, uh, but also, as Matilda pointed out, and we have been publishing recently, um, uh, the condition which now WHO is calling post-COVID-19 condition. So uh, we still call it uh, uh, COVID, long COVID as more of people do, but let's call it post-COVID-19 condition as WHO is calling it. Uh, that condition is a condition which is primarily understood in terms of problems in functioning. So the issue of an infectious disease, which we all understand in terms of mortality and morbidity, is actually resulting at the population level in more problems in functioning. Um, and these two factors together have sort of pushed us in a collection of between 50 and 80 articles in which we've outlined um, the role of rehabilitation in the development of the idea of functioning. Rehabilitation, if you like, is the health strategy, the aim of which is to optimize functioning and to optimize functioning by increasing capacity uh, through health interventions, direct health interventions, and through in interaction with the environment to increase performance of people um, with uh, underlying health conditions. So um, as actually WHO has also uh, said, and Alarco Cieza is head of disability and rehabilitation at WHO, that rehabilitation is the key health strategy of the 21st century. We understand that to mean that the key health issue, what will characterize the 21st century is not expanding survivability so much. We may be peaking at that, certainly dealing with prevention of uh, health conditions and, and injuries, the rest of it will always be a prominent uh, application of public health, but actually the key arena, the focus of healthcare and health sciences in the 21st century is on the lived experience of health, that is to say, functioning. And rehabilitation is ideally suited for that, as a health strategy, because as you know, rehabilitation doesn't cure people. It takes people with the health conditions that they have and optimizes their ability to perform actions in their own context. And that's precisely what functioning is. So for us, the key idea in uh, the ICF is the notion of functioning. It is, if there is one, a paradigm shift in the ICF it is the understanding of functioning understood operationally, both from the perspective of capacity and the perspective of performance. From um, our understanding, um, the distinction between capacity and performance is the absolute central core idea of ICF. That is it. Um, and because of that, we understood stand the developments in the future with respect to both health care and health sciences to be along the lines of developing the science of human functioning. And we call that the human functioning sciences. The first step of which is the development of functioning epidemiology. Um, and we have uh, taken several steps along these directions, the technical details I won't uh, uh, disturb you with, but the primary, besides core set developments and other things which are familiar to the, uh, to the um, professions, um, the idea is to develop standardized ways of reporting functioning outcomes and developing tools for um, um, collecting data. HUDAS certainly is one of them. Uh, in the context of public health, the model disability survey, um, uh, which is the primary public health approach for collecting functioning information. Um, statistically, um, what our focus has been uh, at the University of Lucerne and the Schweizer Paraplegica Forschung, the 
Swiss Paraplegic Research Center, where I work as well, is primarily focusing on developing metrics, functioning, uh, functioning metrics, so that it is possible to actually do health sciences properly and to be able to measure the improvement in functioning before and after an intervention, the improvement in functioning across a collection of disease conditions, or at the population level, the improvement of population levels of functioning. Without a metric, without the capacity to measure functioning, functioning has only heuristic uses. Um, and many of the applications in the past, uh, which Matilda has uh, outlined, has suffered from the fact that there isn't a statistical representation or operationalization of functioning that is measurable. And um, as I learned when I was at WHO and continue to learn, unless you can measure something, there's really no point in talking about it scientifically. And certainly in the public health context, if you can't measure the, the improvements to individual clinical treatments, or across a population, the improvements of a population, then you have no way of representing improvements, no way of having quality of control. You can't understand uh, the degree to which you should invest in particular kinds of interventions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in short, you can't do health science without measurement. So we have been putting a great deal of effort in the activity of perfecting the statistical and uh, survey methodological tools for collecting functioning information um, and developing, most excitingly, actually developing what are called functioning trajectories. And now my only slide, Matilda, is relevant. <laughs> Sorry about this. I only have one. Um, and I give you an example of uh, how uh, functioning trajectories can be used. And my example uh, comes, since it was the only easy, easy picture I had to hand, um, and Matilda is trying to be to display it. It's okay, take, I'll talk through it as you're going. Um, the idea is to develop longitudinally, um, either at the individual level or at a population level, how a person's levels of functioning, once again, measured in terms of a metric, a linear scale of functioning, develop over time with represented by um, the uh, development of, or the longitudinal development of a particular condition. Now, as it happens, there it is. Um, I get this from uh, the World Report on Health and Aging because even though they use slightly different terms, uh, it is, uh, perhaps the most powerful description uh, portrayal of the use of ICF notion of functioning and how it has the most robust scientific application. This, to my mind, after several decades, along with Matilda and Samnath and others, uh, looking at uh, functioning, this is the core idea of ICF. Um, once again, the terminology is different because they decided in aging to use different terms. The, the two graphs are projecting uh, um, some typical aging scenario. This is, of course, across a person's life. Intrinsic capacity is the intrinsic health status of a person. That is the impairments in ICF language, uh, the capacity of the individual uh, that is solely under the skin, the result of a person's health state. And as you notice, and as we all regret, but uh, are used to at this point, that line is unavoidably downwards. Um, there is nothing that can be done about that. We can budge it up, nudge it up a bit, but beyond the general direction, it is down. Functional ability, or what in ICF terms should be called performance, is a different story. And the story is that if through environmental modifications, enhancing capacity is another possibility, or otherwise making it possible for a person with 
restricted capacity to actually perform activities in their world at a higher level than would be predicted by their capacity levels. And to measure that curve, uh, in a sense, gives you uh, the entire picture of rehab and almost all healthcare interventions. So by projecting trajectories of um, performance, that is say functioning understood in terms of its interaction with the environment, the capacity interacting with the environment, you have uh, the basis for science. You have in fact, the first step in the development of what we call functioning epidemiology. So lastly, in one minute, what is functioning science? Human functioning science is the, the formulation of the multidisciplinary, to reflect ICF's um, 360 degree perspective on health, a multiple, multidisciplinary, multidimensional understanding of health as a lived experience of people in their actual context, in their actual lives. This understanding of functioning at the level of the person, at the level of population, and aiming that understanding ultimately to optimize well-being for the individual and optimize societal welfare for the population, for the society, and to bring together as much as possible to understand the dynamics of functioning and the full range of applications of functioning within the health domain and to respond to Catherine's inquiry across all societal domains, because once you're in the, involved in understanding, optimizing functioning, you're optimizing functioning through labor mechanisms, through uh, social welfare programs, you optimize functioning in a variety of environmental modifications, which in the societal context go from legal modifications to putting in curb cuts so that people in wheelchairs you get around. So to finalize, to, to put a lid on this, our aim at the University of Lucerne is to get the research capacity, the educational capacity to together to develop the possibilities of a human functioning science for the future. And I am only one minute over time, Matilda, I too, have been training myself. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Jerome. You've certainly um, challenged us to think differently about um, a metric of, uh, of human functioning. Uh, can I ask if there's anyone who has any questions for Jerome? You're happy to take questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Matilda. Yes, because uh, the science of functioning, uh, if it has to go into the operationalization of functioning, encounters several difficulties. So if we move from academic to policy, how do you see this transfer of knowledge that you are doing in the academic, where everybody could agree on the science of functioning, how this can become at political level, something that is taken by politician as something to buy and how do you see or foresee yes. that this buying could become not only a policy umbrella, but also policy action? That's a damn good question. I mean, if we had several hours, then maybe we do have some extra time. Uh, do one you have of the some things, time? Yeah, one of the things that uh, um, we have thought hard on for many, many years uh, and something which I'm uh, like you actually uh, uh, have devoted my life to. And that is uh, the academics, the science, the development of the science is really sterile without application. Um, and in order to, to make the step of having good science inform policy, uh, we have um, invested a great deal of time and energy into what's called implementation research. So like the WHO, we use uh, implementation um, 
um, um, strategies, I guess you would call it. So all of our PhDs, for example, are required to have um, uh, to, to once they have developed their their work to engage in policy implementation exercises, which requires them to um, develop what the tools of, the, of this particular practice are called strategy briefs and stakeholder dialogues to get policy people to engage with the science bidirectionally. Uh, that is to say, it's not as if the research, let's do something very simple, clinical guidelines for the use of um, core sets for rheumatology or something of the sort. What is the best application or quality management for rehab or something very, very uh, healthcare hard nose? How do we get changes that a good PhD researcher would come up with a good clinical guideline that optimizes functioning for a person with spinal cord injury to say, well, the science is done using everything we do is grounded in functioning. I see if you if you like structures, all of the work that we do, but we structure it in terms of statistical applications of ICF, not, not just uh, using it as a, as a political tool. But once we get into the, um, the, the products of research, um, and those products may be disability assessment using HUDAS as well. I mean, there are products across the board. Then the question is, how do we get those into practice? And the, um, our endeavor at, at every stage, and our success rate is spotty because it's very difficult to do, but the aim is always to get this people who are engaged in policy, who are policy makers and shapers, as, with, as in the implementation language, they are champions of change. Get those people to sit around a table and to convince us that what they need is something that we can provide, and we convince them that something we have that they can benefit from. And in, the, in that interaction, optimally, there is a implementation strategy that results. I mean, it's a short and a bit truncated answer to a very, very important question, namely, how do you get ICF? How do you get functioning? How do you get any act, powerful new tool into practice? Well, you have to get out of the academics. You have to get into a domain that actually implements what you're doing. It's a hard thing to do, and, and it's something that is a challenge for all of us and will always be a challenge. The academic side of it, the training side of it is something that as academics we're very comfortable with, and we can develop uh, training capacity as you people at FDRG and the Education Committee have done, um, but then that isn't enough, you can develop people who are like-minded and knowledgeable in ICF, but what the next step is to actually make change. And um, as you have pointed out, just as a side comment, some of the most fundamental changes, the most impactful changes have been via HUDAS in disability assessment. I mean, I have been part of this in several countries as well, and there are fundamental changes in how people are assessed for social security or other disability benefits in terms of functioning as opposed to medical diagnosis. Because that shift from a medical diagnostic approach to developing you know, levels of disability that a person experiences, shifting it to an ICF approach where you actually assess functioning itself, that is a fundamental shift that has actual consequences for people's lives. And that's where I've actually seen this happen and it is happening. Your example of Taiwan is a good one. So enough from me. Thank you again, Jerome. And um, can I ask Valeria? Valeria has a question. Yes, good morning, everybody. First of all, uh, I'm Valeria from Brazil. I'm an OT and um, what I want to ask Jerome is, he said a measure, measuring capacity and functioning uh, is quite important. 
to check the, how the, the person is going to live his life. I definitely agree with him. However, uh, I, I am a fan of quantitative measures. I love it. But uh, there are uh, ways that we cannot quantify it. That's one of the reasons why we have to perform qualitative research. And I am a fan of it as well. Sometimes it's quite important. Primarily if we are OTs, we definitely care about what the person think, thinks of it and how it performs on their lives and so forth. So I'd like to ask him, okay, so how are we going to measure it yeah. if we, can, we cannot? Yeah, I mean, obviously the measurement challenge is the key one. And some people have argued that the reason that sadly ICF sits on a shelf in many countries is that there is no clear um, um, quantitative measurement application of ICF. So let me give you the short story. It's, it's not simple and I'm not an expert. I'm not a statistician as Matilda knows, I'm a lawyer, <laughs> embarrassingly enough. But here, here's the short story. If you have standardized reporting, if you have a way of capturing functioning information, and that's a very fairly straightforward in the rehab, the occupational therapist, physiotherapist realm, we have FIM, we have SF12, et cetera. We need to crosswalk that with the ICF uh, categorization so that we have a standard categorization we have to take the, the response options and we have to quantitatively map them onto a scale. Then with sufficient data, then we use item response theory, we, um, rash analysis, and we are able to generate from that a metric. And once you have a metric, then you have anchoring and everything goes as planned. Now, this technique is not invented by us. It is a standard technique that is used in education and other kinds of areas. It is, as far as I understand it, once again, I'm not a specialist in this, it is the only way to transform what is inherently a multi-dimensional phenomenon. Namely, you have seeing, hearing, et cetera, et cetera. You have a multi-dimensional phenomenon in functioning and to translate that into a latent trait called functioning and that uh, is mapped onto a single uh, linear scale or metric. And from there on, you have measurement. Now, that's a short story. We have dozens, dozens of papers outlining the technical approach for doing all those steps. That, from our perspective, is done and dusted. That part of the science is over. It's done. Now, the question is how we move from the beginnings of functioning epidemiology, which rests on measurement, that's the only way you can do it, to create a third indicator of health, mortality, morbidity, functioning. Functioning should be the third indicator of health. And you can only do that if you have sophisticated, robust, and scientifically viable measurement, and we have been doing that for decades now um, using, I mean, the core set methodology was an early step in this, but uh, the, the latter steps are based on this kind of statistical manipulation. Now, I am not an expert in this. All I can say is I rely on people who are, most of whom are 50 years younger than me and have more brains than I ever had. Um, but what they can do is provide a very secure measurement foundation for functioning. And that's good because if you can't do it, although I'm a qual qualitative scientist as well, if you can't do it through measurement techniques that are reliable and sufficiently valid in some construct sense, then you don't have science. And uh, if ICF never gets into the domain of health sciences, it will remain a curiosity. And we don't want it to be a curiosity. We want it to be an actual applied tool and the only possible application of ICF or the notion of functioning is by means of 
um, turning it into a metric. Once again, a long story, <laughs> but in a short we period have, of time. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Anyone a question? Again, I, if I could stick an oar in there, um, Jerome, measuring the You always do, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, building on Valeria's question, it's the, the, the science of measuring human functioning, but the science of measuring the environment, because without one, the other is meaningless. Well, except, except that that's why you have performance measurements. If you look at the model disability survey, for example, you collect information on capacity, looking at direct information about a person's ability through their inherent capacity, then you collect information about what they do. And the information about what they do, actually do, in light of their health condition in their environment, actually implicitly gives you the impact of the environment. Now you can tease it out in various kinds of ways. So indirectly measure the impact of the environment because we have found over the years that direct measurement of the, of the disabling impact of environment is extremely difficult to do across the board. You can do it in restricted clinical contexts. That's done in my clinic for that, for that matter. But if you're trying to get at what, what, the, what the interactive output or performance of functioning you can do that by asking questions about a, what a person actually does. Now, it isn't a satisfactory answer to the question, how do you measure the environment? Because I'm coming to the conclusion that there is no general answer to that question. You can do it indirectly by measuring performance. Right. Well, it's, there is still just a couple of moments and uh, I've had a question coming onto the chat. Magdalena, did you want to speak your question or would you like me to read it? Is it in the chat? Magdalena? Yes, uh, well, my good. question, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the question was just like, it was uh, in the chat. So ah, I would like to ask you- any country um, that collects this yeah, kind of Yeah, okay. I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I do not. Um, what you find, I mean, um, all I can speak of is Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland has an insurance company called Suba, which is more or less um, insures everyone in the country. And it collects information mostly about accidents and you know, standard insurance related information in terms of our metric of functioning. And it maps on the results of Bartel, FIM and other kinds of existing tools, which are in common usage. It maps those onto uh, our ICF metric in a standardized way. And uh, SUVA uses uh, that tool um, not, not as a registry, I mean, that's way in the future, but as a way of uh, understanding the impact of rehab in interventions, for example, uh, doing quality management for rehab in, in the context in a restricted, pop I mean, small population. The ultimate aim would be a functional data registry at a national level. Uh, that's, I mean, there are many, many political steps between us now and that, but I don't think there are too many technical steps left to make. I think many of those have been solved. It's the political steps that are gonna be difficult. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll now pass the floor to um, Ros Madden who has her hand up. Hi, uh, everybody. Hi, Roz. It's been <laughs> decades. Um, <laughs> um, this is a, a, probably a continuation of Catherine's question. Um, but I, I think, you know, if we're thinking about the aim of an epidemiology of functioning, 
then the measurement of environment um, is absolutely critical to it. Um, because, and I, and I totally acknowledge all the complexities you're talking about, Jerome, uh, but um, the, uh, you know, if you, if you have the parallel with public health, then, um, and uh, factors that affect health in the environment and in uh, behavioural practice, um, it is, it, it, it ought to be a goal of doing more than sort of stitching together some implications of the environment and actually, yeah, yeah. you know, going to the heart of the ICF model and investigating those um, interactions. Yeah, I mean, God knows it would be nice. Um, but um, I mean, even the social determinants of health literature, where you have people looking at correlations between income levels, correlations between access to you know, clean water. I mean, there are many, many determinants of health or you know, determinants of risk factors of health, even in the area of smoking. I mean, smoking is probably as far advanced as a environmental uh, impact on people's just plain health state, not, a, not even functioning state, but just their health state. And we, ha I mean, all, we have really, really a lot of data about the impact, but actually measuring it in a way which you could confident, confidently say you have the measurement of the impact of a behavior, not, I mean, not, not to say the whole environment, but a behavioral risk factor is still in the future. So uh, that, that's something very discreet, something we have lots of knowledge about. We even have causal mechanisms to understand the underlying mechanisms of what's going on. But compare that with something as abstract as the environmental effect on functioning of anti-discrimination law. And the number of factors that are involved to try to operationalize it collect data about it, and in any way come to grips with the, the notion of what is the measurable impact of that environmental factor on functioning is perhaps, I mean, maybe with machine learning and big data and who knows what magic is in the future, but I think our best bet now is this indirect way of saying, we see what a person actually does. We know with, say, a spinal cord injury, what they're capable of doing as a capacity. Mm -hmm. We see what they do. The environment must be the impact. Okay, do it indirectly. Sorry. Okay. Couldn't I just um, ask everyone to hold their questions because we have our next speaker ready, after yeah, which sorry. we've got half an hour for discussion. So uh, keep these uh, thoughts coming and um, jot them down as our next speaker. And with that, I'd like to introduce Priti Arun. Uh, Priti, are you ready there? She's going to talk of using ICF in a facility for chronically mentally ill persons. Thank you. Yeah, so shall I begin? Yes, please. Thank you, Priti. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you, everyone. So I would like to start sharing my uh, presentation. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone, greetings from India. Yes. I'm Dr. Preeti Arun. And at the outset, I would thank the organizers to give me an opportunity to be part of the symposium and to interact with everybody, particularly Dr. Eduardo and Dr. Gurpreet Binipal, who was actually instrumental in introducing me to everyone else. And it is great to be part of Team ICF. I'm presenting the experience of use of ICF in our center. So I'm talking from, from my experience. So this is Mental Health Institute, and uh, it started functioning in 2013 from another building, and this building was commissioned in March 2019. 
I'm um, Professor and Head in Department of Psychiatry, and I'm Additional Director of this Mental Health Institute. And I'm Joint Director of Government Rehabilitation Institute for Intellectual Disability. So I'll be sharing my experience of all these places. So I uh, have received training as Master Trainer for ICF in the year 2004. And since then, I have been involved in imparting training programs for trainers. This presentation will cover our experience in these three facilities. The institute I'm working in is Government Medical College and Hospital. And with Department of Psychiatry, we have two more institutes. One is Government Rehabilitation Institute for Intellectual Disabilities, where we cater to intellectual disability, autism, cerebral palsy, and multiple disabilities, and Mental Health Institute. Mental Health Institute has a facility called Disability Assessment and Rehabilitation Triage. And this is a facility for severe mental illness. So more detailed uh, experience from this and touching onto other also. And uh, uh, in this uh, DART, we have used ICF to assess the needs of rehabilitation. And we have tried to make assessment of how effective was ICF in assessment of rehabilitation services. And uh, if these could have any impact. So in autism clinic, uh, I'll be sharing a bit from that also. There we had conducted a study where we had used ICF for assessment of functioning. And I'll, I'll also be discussing how ICF can be used in intellectually disabled persons, the population we have in grid. So coming to the city, um, giving a background of myself, from where do I come? So Chandigarh is a city in North India and it is... It was planned by Lee Corbusier, and um, it is also known as the City Beautiful and also the City of Peace. And it is famous for its open hand monument. And open hand monument symbolizes the spirit of the city, open to give and receive. It is a planned city, and with every uh, sector has specific dimensions, and every sector is self-contained within itself. So you can see that in this map. And this is the open hand monument. This is the GRID, the Institute for Intellectual Disabilities. And this is Mental Health Institute. Oh. I've already shown you people. And this is the facility, Disability Assessment and Rehabilitation Triage Center. And uh, in the same building, we also have a halfway home for uh, um, oh, persons who have recovered. Yeah, am I audible? I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So this is the DART building or Disability Assessment and Rehabilitation Trials building. So um, coming to the background of the experience, the Department of Psychiatry was started in 1994. And department has strong emphasis on community and rehabilitation oh. services. Because in our center, uh, in our city, we already have one established uh, postgraduate institute of medical education and research. So we uh, decided to go to the community and rehab services. And it was started in 1997 and rehab services started in 2013. And rehab services are run under Mental Health Institute, which is a facility for chronic mentally ill persons. So coming to the DART background, DART was started with the objective that despite advancement in pharmacological treatment, large number of patients continue to have deficits in cognitive, social, and vocational areas. And these deficits interfere in rehabilitation and long-term outcome. It was started on 31st of December, 2012 for providing need-based non-pharmacological services for the patients of chronic mental disorders who have recovered from acute phase of illness but still have significant deficit in social, cognitive, and vocational skills. And there is a sufficient sizable population of them. In February 2017, inpatient rehabilitation services were started initially in the DART building but later on shifted to Mental Health Institute. So the services in DART are... Uh, uh, Neurocognitive Rehabilitation Clinic, Social Skills Clinic, Vocational Rehabilitation Clinic, a placement cell, crisis resolution and home-based treatment, 
day care, disability clinic, and occupational health services. So here we have clinical psychologists, counselors, and psychiatric social workers who are providing services in DART. So all services are free of cost because it's a government facility. Patients are expected to remain in DART for whole day, that is from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This initial assessment of service users, clinical condition, disability, social support, vocational achievements, and activities of daily living. Neurocognitive assessment and social skill assessments are done as per need. Some patients come only for a few sessions, hence they stay for two to three hours. Services provided are customized to the needs of the service users with emphasis on rehabilitation in the relevant area. So um, ICF, I'm not going into detail that what it is, just I've put there that we looked at the ICF and uh, uh, it's, it's with this aim to provide scientific basis for understanding health-related states, outcomes, and determinants. So we were interested in outcomes and determinants. And uh, second, to establish a common language for describing health and health-related states in order to improve communication between different users, such as healthcare workers, researchers, policymakers, and public, including people with disabilities. So here we wanted to include people with disability. Hence, we decided to use some part of ICF. And third, to permit comparison. This is basically the goal of ICF. So we looked at the model and we realized that it is mainly the activities and participation that we uh, will be providing services for. So the objectives of applying ICF on patients with severe mental illness was to understand the functional status, that how SMI patients are doing in important life areas, having a conversation, eating safely, getting enough to eat, making friends, understanding the instructions, etc. Are they getting better at these skills? What can be done to change the environment to help people reach their goals? And which facilities are demonstrating improvement in real life skills? So uh, to start, we held a half-day workshop for the whole department, including faculty, residents, psychologists, social workers, and MPhil students. So training on application of the whole ICF checklist was imparted, and it was decided to select only activity limitation and participation restriction for DART service users. The efficacy of training to be provided would be assessed comprehensively on these domains. So this was started in 2013 to fulfill the objectives of DART. And then later there was some change in consultants and in the detailed worker performer. So uh, though for initial one and a half to two years, this was done regularly, but then it was somewhere stopped. So for the purpose of uh, this talk, for this presentation, 31 service users of DART for whom the ICF activity and participation data was available were reached out. And ICF was re-administered to assess that if the impact of services have made can be measured using ICF. So basically the applicability of ICF, what we had started with. So uh, the age of the participants was 43.96 years. 28 were male, eight were female. Maximum had eight to 12 years of formal education and uh, 14 uh, equal number had graduate and postgraduate uh, degrees. The diagnosis was schizophrenia, 17, food disorder, three, organic disorder, six, and others, five. In sociodemographic, um, 17 were unemployed, eight had employment, five were retired, and one not known. All the patients were living within 10 kilometer radius of the facility because they were supposed to come on a daily basis. Two patients were coming only for daycare activities. 13 were coming for vocational rehabilitation and 16 were coming for neuropsychological rehabilitation. So duration of illness was more than 10 years for 21 patients and only seven had mild disability, rest all had moderate, severe or profound disability. 
so treatment continuation um, four had discontinued because of covid 19 pandemic protocols and uh, uh, six were coming only for opd treatment eight were coming regularly to our dart services so when we looked at the different domains there was uh, um, in D1 learning and applying knowledge, there was a change in capacity, significant change in capacity. In uh, mobility, there was a, uh, in performance, there was significant change. And in self-care, there was change in capacity. All these had improved. And in personal interaction and relationships, there was uh, improvement in capacity. In major life areas, again, there was improvement in capacity and community, social and civic life, again, there was improvement in capacity. So the reason for discontinuing, um, few cases discontinued the services because of distance, either because of geographic location or transfer to other states because the family had moved away. Some patients because of less improvement and uh, every time they had to bear the expense of travel, they discontinued the service. Few patients didn't continue because of no perceived improvement and preferred to consult regular OPD for medication follow-ups only. So here I would like to uh, point out that uh, when we uh, were assessing them, we could see that there were many areas, but they still, um, they could not perceive any improvement and hence they stopped coming. So this was uh, the reasons taken from them recently. So if we look at that, how ICF helped achieve the objectives, so it, since it assesses functionality and disability, how the illness affects the capacity of the person to perform expected roles in the society was assessed. And the DART team with the help of ICF assessment is able to tap those restrictions in capacity and performance. The rehab team not only helps the patients to overcome those restrictions, but also encourages caregivers to be part of the program. So here we are able to involve the caregivers also without really talking to them in scientific jargon, but we are able to um, involve them. So this is the experience of using ICM in DART by one of our uh, staff that it helped in assessing activities of daily living and independent daily living comprehensively. And it helped in understanding that though SMI patients have the capacity to perform various activities, but they somehow need assistance working on minimizing those dependency with therapeutic techniques, for example, graded task assignments, help not only the professionals, but also the caregivers to work productively without any undue stress. So when we look at uh, the, what were the challenging areas? The challenging areas are environmental factors with multiple barriers. There are support and relationships, attitudinal barriers in society, services and systems are not there, though policies may be there. And uh, like in attitudinal barriers of society, there was uh, recently one reporter had uh, reported in the newspaper about uh, uh, behavior of, um, um, of mentally ill patients. Obviously, they, ha they are having illness and they are admitted in ward for, uh, uh, for these problems only. But then this written report in newspaper impacts many and in support and relationships again it is uh, the relationship and support from immediate family from caregivers not only the caregivers uh, but also the healthcare workers there also there may be challenges so ICF gives the comprehensive framework for evaluation of needs and action points so if it is evaluation on ICF is done routinely, then it would be easier to pick the areas of concern. That's what uh, we believe. And brief course sets on schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar disorder would be of immense value in achieving this objective. Within the rehabilitation services, some caregivers of service users experience negative attitude of healthcare providers. 
it could be a negative transparency as well as counter transparency it could be both so now coming to intellectual disability our institute has 450 individuals with intellectual disability enrolled in school of special education and provides clinical and therapeutic services to about 500 persons on outpatient basis for intellectual disability, each child in school has an individualized education plan developed on the basis of existing schedules in special education. Using ICF would lead to maximizing the potential of each child by comprehensive assessment and providing specific inputs, the way we could do for um, mental illness. And for ID, disability assessment is done using a single item, that is intelligence quotient, which doesn't convey much by itself. So though evaluation of adaptive functions are considered for making a diagnosis, the needs of persons with intellectual disability can be conveyed by using a comprehensive functioning assessment by ICF. So in Richard, one study from- minutes. Yeah, I'll be finishing in one minute. So in one study from department, ICF-CY was used for children with autism spectrum disorder and other scales used for Rudas and Nisonga child behavior checklist to assess behavior and functioning. And ICF was able to capture the full profile of the child, including deficit areas, challenging behavior and strengths. So use of ICF should be increased in next decade. And ICF is a good tool to comprehensively assess functioning of the individual, evaluate the services, its usability and usefulness, and assess in which area services need to be strengthened and how to deliver individualized rehab services. So with this, I acknowledge the help of Dr. Jyoti Mishra and Dr. Subhash Das, my colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Priti. Um, are there any questions for Priti? Uh, and we'll go straight on into the panel discussion. So if uh, Jerome and Matilda are ready to put their screens on uh, again too. Thank you. Any questions for Priti? Catherine, I, I'd like to mention that we have a translator now. Her name is Vanya. And if anybody else would like to have her services he was found. Thank you, Eduardo. So we're going to introduce um, Vanya Lickfeld. Is Vanya there? She can put on. Okay, Vanya, screen. you can introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Vanya. I'm here to facilitate the, the communication between uh, Portuguese speakers. All right. So if you don't feel, feel comfortable speaking English, just uh, speak with me so I can translate the best way that I can. So for the speaker, please try to speak in a slow pace and short phrases so I can remember and translate to them. All right. Thank you, Vanya. Um, I have a question from Nicola Fortune. So Nicola, if you could go next. Hi, Nick. Hello. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everybody. And thanks very much, Pretty, for your um, really interesting presentation. Um, I just had a question about the data that uh, the results that you were presenting about changes in capacity and performance by life areas. And um, um, for some of the life areas, you saw an uh, improvement in capacity, but no improvement in performance. And I'm just wondering what your interpretation of that is the environment, the limiting factor. So some, you know, even though capacity improves, you're not seeing improvement in performance because the environment is limiting. I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you. Nicola. Yeah, thank you so Sophia, much. Did you want to translate? Sorry? Did you need to translate for Portuguese speakers? So if anybody, if anybody did understand, so you can ask me to translate. So you need to speak a little short sentence, then I can translate. Guys, did understand the question? Okay, well, we'll, we'll go ahead now. If anybody puts a hand up not to understand. Yeah. Raise your hand. Know. Thank you. Go ahead, Pretty. Yeah, so thank you so much for this question. And this was a very important thing that we realized. And we realized that uh, 
this was mainly happening because environment was not supportive. You were absolutely uh, bang on when you said that it was the environment. And that is why I said that environment becomes a very important factor and environment in the, uh, in the form of the attitudes and uh, 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 attitudes of even immediate family members. And uh, so all that becomes very important. Yeah. Thank you, Pretty. I have another question from Valeria. Go ahead, Valeria. Yes, the Valeria, only because, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, sorry yeah, Valeria. Yeah, please. Uh, I think you can ask her in little phrases, and then Vanya can translate all all, all of the questions, okay. all of the answers. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay, Vanya, could you please ask her how to deal with um, autism because I read in certain moment that she deals with it. She can apply uh, what she conducted with autism children. I don't deal with autism. I deal with adults and elderly people. But I know that uh, many occupational therapists that do and it might be quite interest, interesting for them. Did you get it? Yes. Okay. Ok, então, para os que falam português, a pergunta foi como que ela lidar com as uh, uh, desordens do autismo, porque ela, como profissional, só trabalha com pessoas idosas. Então, ela quer saber como que uh, ela lidar com esse transtorno. Ok? All right, you can go on and answer. Priti, did you want to respond to Valeria about children with autism? Yeah, so uh, in children with autism, uh, the assessment was, uh, if I, I mean, I'll just first of all uh, state the question again so that you know that I've understood it correctly. So what I understood that you have asked about the challenges of administering ICF or any kind of schedule on the children, right? Am I right, Valeria? Okay, good. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So um, the when we were administering ICF, it wasn't the children who were being asked all the questions because it is about assessment of functioning. So um, and the, most of the interview was done with the parents. And uh, we were also taking information from teachers uh, wherever we could so to have that comprehensive assessment. And uh, since there were many other scales being administered, so those were on children also. But you are right that it is challenging to administer uh, questionnaires and schedules on children. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nicola, did you have a follow-up question? Anya, please. Yes, okay, sorry. Okay, just hand up still. Catherine, <laughs> <Hey>, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ok, então, basicamente, o que ela falou foi que é um desafio ainda lidar com esse transtorno. Então, eles têm uma conversa, primeiramente, de, educacional com os pais da, dessas crianças é, com autismo. E tem o, a participação também de professores né, e a, a área educacional para instruí-los nessa, nessa situação. Mas que continua um desafio. Ok. So you can continue. Thank you. Are there any questions for any of our speakers, Matilda, uh, Jerome, or uh, further questions for Pretty? This is supposed to be a panel discussion, so the panelists can uh, question each other. No further questions? I was um, thinking about the issue of um, turning science into policy and whether there were any uh, suggestions. Uh, Catherine, or Catherine. Oh, right. Stefanos, yes, is that you? Jerome, want to say something? Yeah, I, I actually have a question uh, to Pretty. Um, 
how did you in, how did you um, capture the difference between capacity and performance in your measurement? Vanya, please. So, can you repeat, please, the question? Oh, okay. Yeah, Eu, well, com como que eles medem ou apresentam as diferenças entre desempenho yeah. e capacidade? Yes, because my internet was okay. okay. Uh, That's Sounds like the question I asked, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, I have to answer that. So it was basically that um, whether they are able to do it with assistance or they are not able to do that. So that was the um, without assistance or with assistance. That, that was the differentiating feature between capacity and performance. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Stefanos, did you have a question? Saw your screen pop up. No, 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 I don't have a question. No, it's fine. Okay. So if you um, thinking about this issue of moving from science to policy that Matilda put up. Uh, what about some of the countries that you come from? Because you're coming from many different countries. And I wondered whether there's any experiences from other countries. She's Ela está perguntando se ele tem experiências trazidas de outros países. Okay, you can answer those. Anyone else? Okay. And then I had one further question for Pretty. Uh, you mentioned about the disability being mild, moderate, severe, or profound. And I wondered how you made that estimate of mild, moderate, severe, and profound. Okay, let me translate uh, okay. this. <laughs> É, Caterine está perguntando ah, como que ela mede a diferença do, do autismo entre moder, é, é, as diferenças entre o autismo, né, que é um, um, um moderado e o mais severo. Tá, ok? Ok, you can answer. So, uh, for assessment of disability, we have uh, um, the uh, standard schedule which is approved by the government and based on that we are making assessments of disability and uh, it is a scale for um, uh, I mean for all the three disorders there are different scales and based on those scores we assess either mild moderate or severe disability. Thank you. Okay, I will just say that the just a second. Just a second. Ela disse que tem um, o governo tem um padrão né, que eles uh, avaliam essa, essa disorder. Né, então, é um, é um padrão que, que eles avaliam a capacidade de, de cada um para saber em qual nível de, do, do autismo que eles se encaixam. Ok, you can go on. So, are there any further questions or discussion points? Valeria. <laughs> <laughs> for the okay. ones who know me, Eduardo knows me. Oh, Valeria, you are here. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. For the ones who know me, they will always know that I'll ask something. <laughs> I'll try to ask slowly, okay, Vanya? Okay. Uh, Dr. Aaron said that there are some measures in India uh, for the autism capacity. I'm asking her to share the ref I don't know if I understood properly, okay, Dr. Aram, sorry. But uh, if so, could you please share the references with us? Okay, Valeria está perguntando para que possa é, compartilhar as referências que ela tem em relação a, ao espectro autista. Not not only with the autism, uh, but with uh, the autism capacity. Okay, 
com a, a capacidade autista. Yeah, so uh, the first question in which I answered that there are schedules, this is about disability assessment, in which we assess mild, moderate, severe, and profound degree of disability. Capacity and performance assessment is done using ICF checklist. So uh, there is no separate schedule for capacity and performance in India. It is the same, which is by WHO, which is ICF checklist. So is ICF checklist, is that it? That's it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ela diz que não tem, não tem uma diferença, que ela usa o ICF checklist. Então, ela usa isso como, como referência. So, there isn't a, an instrument, properly speaking, to measure and to link with the ICF. Does she do that? only by a checklist. Uh, another question is, I don't know, because as I said, I don't deal with children, but is there a core set to do so? Ok, ela está perguntando se tem algum, algum outro curso que ela não trabalha com criança, que pode ajudá-la nesse, nesse aspecto. Uh, eu posso perguntar em português e você traduz, eu Sim, acho, acho melhor. Que é melhor. Eu acho que é melhor. Ok, na verdade, o que eu quero perguntar não é sobre curso. Ela falou sobre o autismo, né? Uhum. Eu não trabalho com autismo, eu trabalho com adultos e idosos, uhum. mas é, há vários terapeutas ocupacionais que certamente vão se interessar por isso, né? Uhum. É, então, ela falou que ela usa checklist, uma checklist para avaliar os autistas. Sim. Né? É, eu não sei se eu entendi mal, mas é, ela falou que na Índia são usados instrumentos para lidar com isso e pelas regras da CIF nós sabemos que há regras de conexão, linkage rules, uhum. or link rules, né? Então eu queria saber se lá eles têm instrumentos propriamente ditos para medir isso, para fazer essas regras de conexão com a CIF, tá? Ou se ela o faz apenas por meio da checklist ou se já existem core sets para avaliar especificamente essas questões das crianças com espectro autista. Difícil para você traduzir, mas agora o problema não é mais... <risos> <risos> ok, I'll try my best. Ok. So, pretty, uh, uh, your name, can you repeat your name? V Valerie? Valeria. Valeria. Yeah. Valeria is asking if you just use the checklist to measure the autism or do you use some tools that is linked to ICF? Is that the question, Valeria? Yes, it is, because according to the ICF, it, it will be ideal to have uh, uh, validated measures so you could link with the ICF so you could uh, know if the children have a light deficiency, or a moderate deficiency. So what I want to know is if in your country or if everybody could share, could share with us, there are instruments that we could do that. So we could link with the ICF or if it, it is done manually by doing a checklist or a corset. I don't deal with children, but definitely there are many OTs who'd like to be interested on it. Thank you, Valeria. Pretty has put a response into the chat that uh, she uh, uses a, a government tool, uh, assessment tool, and the ICF checklist, which is directly derived from the ICF. Oh. Thank you. Now, Stefanis, you do have a question now? So just me translate, so, sorry. Ela sorry. Respondeu, ela respondeu que, o, que eles usam eh, esse checklist, que ele já está é, relacionado com a ICF. Ok? So, you can continue. Thank you, Stefanis. Ok. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually amazing to have uh, Jerome and Matilda here sharing, you know, their experience. They've been there from the start. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, it's... I miss that we are we are together in one place and we can chat over a glass of wine and beer and just chat about ICF. But 
just for, for Jerome and, and Matilda, if you think back over the past 20 years, um, from that, what was the biggest thing that you've learned or that ICF enabled you? What new understanding did you gain over the past 20 years as a result of ICF? Okay, uh, ele está perguntando qual foi I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, sorry, I'm just wondering, uh, um, Eduardo, do the, the translations, do, do we need the translation uh, every time or, or not? Um, because there's... Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, we are, uh, I am chatting with everybody. Somebody would like to hear the translations uh sentences by sentence and other one uh, asked me to have the translation in the chat oh, so okay. i i think vanya can decide what she wants to know to yeah. to do I, if, I if you do it in the chat it i think it can could be good yeah i think there's perhaps two two options one I mean, we are recording this and it will be uploaded to, to, to YouTube in, in the end where you can have the translations or have the translation perhaps in chat. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, it, it's, it's one different thing when you're in a, in a live conference and people sit the stuff on the ears and you, and you, and you uh -huh. translate, but I don't think it, it's, yeah, it's okay. open for discussion. It's, it's, yeah. Vanya, does it work for you? For the chat, yeah. yes, yes, okay. it might take a little longer, but no problem. Okay, Stefan, um, a little slow, please. Actually, for me, it's fine. <laughs> this okay. is a question oh. from okay. Matilda. Yeah. Okay, said. it was clear to me, and I have a very brief answer. I think that the introduction of environment for me as a doctor was the issue that gave a lot of hope. I would say that learning that sometimes, because when you deal with patients and chronic patients like me as a neurologist, sometimes for people with disability, um, the resili resiliency uh, was much lower before ICF. In a sense, for those who do not see that it is always possible to do something in the environment, the issue of bringing ICF into this scenario, for me, beside all the political and blah, and blah, blah, was to bring in hope there is always something possible to do, which in a sense, it's the big difference is the ICF revolution. You cannot do always something on body function and body structure, but you can always do something on the environment, which then brings in so many actors. And to me, that was the, largest thing, using ICF in education, in employment, into the all different areas, transportation, mobility, it can be done. And this for me was the really, the, the major change from a, uh, let's say, uh, model in which it was seeming so difficult to do things in which, in fact, then you can do things and rehabilitation alone, working on the body function and body structure can do a little, for majority of those who have these aging and uh, chronic conditions, which is uh, almost two thirds of the world. So I believe that introducing ICF was introducing areas of possible work and was bringing inside a strong ethical issue. Maybe Jerome, you can add to this. Because if you have knowledge that you can do something, then if you don't do it, it's a political choice. Because ICF was bringing in the idea that you can do something, you can change barriers into facilitators, then you don't do them, then it's a political choice and it's discriminating and stigmatic. So it's allowing also to read stigma and discrimination as operationalized issues that you can see. I don't know, Jerome, if you agree with this. Thank you, Matilda. Jerome? Just, just a short answer. I mean, I didn't get that from the ICF. And the reason is, that has been known in the disability community since the 1940s. <laughs> so the disability community has known that for a long time. ICF formalized an intuition that the disability human rights advocates had 
uh, the first time I started reading it was the early 60s in, uh, in Berkeley in California. Anyway, but the, the insight I got, I mean, it's, it's important that it's institutionalized in the WHO document. That, that is a driver of action. But the insight that I think ultimately come away from me is uh, to understand what health is. Uh, health is being able, uh, yeah, the health is not biology or magic or anything. Health is being able to get on with life. That's health. Uh, a, a philosopher by the name of Hans Georg Gadamer says, health should be a window pane. You only notice it when there's something on the screen. Otherwise, health should disappear because health is just living. That's what health is. And ICF says, the best way to operationalize health is what you can do in your life. That's health. And I like that. I mean, it really works out for me. Can I add something? Um, thank you. Oh, yes, go ahead, Matilda. No, Jerome, <laughs> for me, ICF also finally brought in the idea that the disability community does not exist. Sorry, but although they knew it, I think that maybe only them knew because they were living disability. Uh, ICF is bringing into the scenario the issue that disability is not for this minority social, whoever they are. Um, combating the other thing is that a disability is a human condition. It is normality. Okay. It is everyone. That, that's what disability is. It's not some that's special marker. It's what it means to be a human being. And that's another insight for you, Isaiah. Yeah, okay, so then we agree. Two huge insights. I'd like to ask if Ross Madden or Cassia Bishala, who have also been embedded in ICF since it, before it was born, uh, would like to reflect on their insights using ICF. Ross, Castia, sorry to put you on the spot, but I thought it's long term. You're putting me on the spot. I just, um, I was just sitting there taking pleasure in listening to, whoops, I've lost my video stream, <laughs> listening to uh, uh, Matilda and Jerome. So great insights. Um, well, I'll try to reflect statistically. And um, I think the uh, I think that the whole model, I mean, I was involved in the 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 drafting of the model um, in the 90s as well. And I think that whole process and the excitement of that process and the number of people around the world and the different perspectives on disability. Oh, start my video. <laughs> With my, my spots on my face at the moment. Um, that was very exciting. But as a statistician, I would have to say that the... Uh, that we still have so far to go that the, I, I don't, don't think it was an awe-inspiring um, revelation, but that we had a long way to go. And in the early years, we thought we were getting there. And then we realised you must never stop. You have to keep teaching. You have to keep harassing people. And it is very, very difficult to reflect um, the ICF fully in statistical collections. Um, but I won't go on at length. That's just what springs to mind. I'm sorry, it's not very well thought through. Thanks, Ros. Thanks for stepping up to that discussion because I knew having been a long-term, uh, not only um, involved in the birth of ICF, but also in the, uh, the long history of, of ICF. But that statistical perspective is, is a different perspective. And now I'll turn to Cassia. Would, have you got some reflection on 20 years and what ICF? Yes. Is a challenge? Um, well, I will talk about this a little bit in the afternoon. 
but uh, I always said when I was training on ICF that uh, the classification is like uh, a lyric that is in a Brazilian samba uh, that said, everything that put us together separated us because everybody uh, turns very excited when they know ICF because of its uh, size and complexity. But even uh, because of this, they stay away because they fear of using ICF. It's difficult, it's big. And uh, this was the, the difficult challenge, the, mo the most difficult, the, the biggest challenge we had. Uh, so uh, for the, the beginning, uh, we need some results. And when people start to, to show results of using ICF, people stay more you know, friendly with the classification and it was uh, easier to adopt, but it's still very difficult. We don't have anything on statistics. We had a uh, few institutions, fortunately they are big, using ICF uh, as a, a daily basis, but uh, we don't see many results published. So you need to improve this kind of thing. But the difficult was, uh, how I always said, everything that put us together, that attract us, separated us, like the, in the lyric. And thank you, Cassia. And I have one more person to ask if they can step up, and that would be Janice Miller, who was instrumental on the environmental factors uh, development. Janice, would you have a, a reflection? M mute, unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. And hello to all and colleagues. And um, I, I actually wanted just to make a comment about um, some of the challenges that were noted in Jerome and Matilda's presentations, and also related to the work that was done last year across countries to collect use cases on um, the use of functional data and the challenges for getting it into um, uh, agreed and mandated data collections. And really just to say um, from some experience here in Canada that uh, there was really a very strong need for a bottom up as we are talking about today with our experience with various groups and a very, very important top down part <laughs> which involves a tremendous amount of communication and lobbying and connections with decision makers, policy makers and those who are funding these programs. So until you can demonstrate to decision makers and funders, et cetera, that the data you collect is of value both from a person's perspective, improvement in function and quality of life, but also that there is efficiency and effectiveness in the programs that are delivered across the spectrum. And within our country, for example, across jurisdictions, each province and territory has control over their healthcare spending, one has to try to uh, communicate um, the importance of collecting this data in a standard way and using tools such as ICF and others that uh, ensure that we're talking the same language. And when you're talking with politicians and decision makers, it's really important to move up to levels that they can understand if they don't have background in science or rehabilitation or other areas. Um, so our success uh, in many registries is really to develop a set of indicators. And those indicators answer key questions that are important to funders as well as to service providers. So if you can convince those uh, groups or individuals that the indicators you can produce in national or regional reports 
will answer their questions about how well their services are performing, how well people do after the service is provided, for example, um, and indicators on efficiency that, that has a key impact on their funding, et cetera. That, and it's a long process, it takes a long time, but I think when um, we did our survey last year on use cases, it came up time and time again, and WHO asks us this question, how can we move this uh, key classification as a building block to those funders who can make a difference and um, declare that ICF uh, is a key part of those, those uh, data collection registries? That's just my comment. We had that experience. It took many, many years. Once we got one jurisdiction to jump in, the others jumped in because they could see the benefit of learning from each other on how best to deliver services and, and have the best outcome for their clients. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. Can I throw the floor open? Does anybody else like to reflect on how the ICF might have infant affected their practice or their world of disability? Hello, may I? Hello. Sorry, who was that? Hello, hello, Sorry. Eleni. Hello, hello, I'm Eleni. Uh, I'm based in London. I'm program manager and lecturer in health and social care at the University of Wales Trinity St. David here in London. And uh, I'm very glad to see Dr. Ronaldi and Professor Bigen Bach. We have collaborated before on ICF. Uh, for me, the most important thing ICF has contributed all these years um, is this shift of thinking from the purely this biomedical model towards this more biopsychosocial way of viewing health and disability. And um, I believe this has led also to discussion, research, and in practice as well, in clinical practice, it is evident, and uh, try to not try to fix the person with disability in, co in quotation marks, but try to see all the factors, the social determinants of health um, uh, surrounding the person and try to make the environment more facilitating and uh, more inclusive for them instead of uh, just uh, trying again to focus on the body functions and uh, structure only. So I believe uh, this is for me at least uh, one of the main, um, uh, let's say, uh, contributing factors of ICF uh, throughout these years uh, in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, we are going to go on to a talk by uh, Nicola Fortune on the hour. Um, that gives us just a few minutes and I wouldn't be being a good physiotherapist if I didn't ask you all to stand up, change your focal distance, jump up and down for two minutes and then come back to your screens to start promptly again on the hour. So just take a pause, stand up, walk around your chair, uh, hey. or just move a little for just hey. a couple of minutes and okay. then come straight back. How many minutes? Um, well, start again promptly on the hour. We will be starting on the, on the hour. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, five minutes, five minutes. Five minutes. Hello? Hello. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, it's Lauri Lahti. Okay, uh, go on. So just uh, wanting to check uh, technically. Uh, so you can hear my voice? Yes. And uh, see my face? Yes. <laughs> Okay, and just uh, because uh, uh, there were some technical challenges, so uh, if I may just check if I can now share my screen. Uh, you, you are a host, let, let me check. Uh, because I, wait a moment, I have it here actually. Sh just just let me see if I can. Uh, there, is, so there is a green button uh, below the screen. Mm. Share screen. Just testing. Yes. You did. Video stream. You did. Hi, Bert. How are you? Uh, wait, wait a moment. It's just uh, still another. Uh... What, bye? So, 
So I'm testing. Uh, oh, okay, I can see. So Lauri Lahti presenting uh, trustworthy artificial intelligence. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's that's nice because uh, sometimes it can happen that the connection is somehow okay. lost. Okay, don't, don't worry. Uh, okay. And, and I'm so pleased to be uh, attending and thank you for all this kind help you have provided already. Okay, we are very happy to have you on board. And uh, may I ask, uh, was it planned that uh, you are also now recording all these video uh, meetings? Uh, yes, we are recording. We will so that's really it. great. And so will it be uh, online ju just like uh, ordinarily on YouTube or on some other place? Oh uh, yeah, I don't know yet. icfeducation.org, you will, you will find the, the information about in some weeks. Okay, that's really great. Okay. So, uh, uh, th thank you for checking it. So I just, if I, uh, wait a moment, I was just uh, wondering if I want to change my slides. Yes, now it's perhaps changing. Yeah, yeah, it's changing. Uh, you can see. Yes, I can see. Th thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you we'll now uh, cl close uh, the sharing. Okay, thank you. There are two presentations before yours, and then okay. you can do it. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, afterwards, uh, uh, what is the time uh, for a shared panel discussion? Was it a plan that uh, 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 I have a 10 minutes time? Was it so? Yes, you have 10 minutes, everybody. And then we uh, have then the question, questions after your presentation. Okay, and then are we then also having some extra panel discussion together or no? Yes, 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 after after the, the block. We have three okay. or four presentations and then we have questions. Okay, that's really nice. And uh, so, sorry, still asking a little bit like technical question. It varies uh, from the meetings to meeting. So basically asking the, like um, if I, if someone wants to ask for the next uh, uh, speech, uh, uh, so was there some button actually you were supposed to press here or just like interrupt uh, uh, politely? No, just, just interrupt. No button. Just like to talking kindly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's, thank you. you.
Hello, everybody. Has everyone had a chance to just stand up and move about a little bit? And now ready to listen to Nicola. You, Nicola, ready to go? Good. Yes, I Where am. You go, Thanks, Nicola. Catherine. Okay. It's a pleasure to introduce a colleague. I'll just try to share my screen, get my PowerPoints up. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks. I hope I'll be able to change slides okay too. So thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I'm Nicola Fortune. I work at the University of Sydney uh, with the Centre of Research Excellence in Disability and Health. And I'm a member of the Australian Collaborating Centre for the WHO Family of International Classifications. Um, oops. Wanted to go back. Oh, there we go. Gone back. Um, before I begin my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the Jara people who are the traditional owners of the land where I live. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. It's a real privilege to be um, presenting here at the seventh International ICF Education Symposium, celebrating 20 years of ICF. It's hard to believe. And I'd like to pay special tribute to my colleague and mentor, Dr. Ros Madden. Ros, as many of you will know, um, was very actively involved in development of the ICF and played a big role in ICF implementation in Australia. And she continues to be a very strong advocate for the ICF. Ros's PhD thesis focused on investigating how the ICF has been used to improve measurement of functioning and related statistics. And I think I thank Ros for her assistance in preparing this presentation. So this presentation is about the role ICF can play in relation to national statistics on functioning, disability and health. I'm going to start by outline, outlining a range of purposes of statistical data on functioning and disability and the main sources of statistical data. Then I'll give some examples to illustrate the value of ICF for monitoring rights and equity, for understanding the experience of disability, um, particularly for informing policy, and the use of ICF in disability-specific administrative data collections. And finally, I'll um, briefly mention some areas in which ICF has been underutilised so far and give my thoughts on what progress we might hope to see in the years ahead. So it's important to be clear about purpose because data should be designed to be fit for purpose. These are the main broad purposes that I've come up with for which statistical data on functioning and disability might be collected. So first of all, estimating disability prevalence is an obvious one. Monitoring equity and rights for people with disability. Understanding the experience of disability, especially to inform social policy. Identifying particular populations of people with disability, for example, to target specific policies or programs. Um, and understanding functional functioning at population level as part of general population health monitoring or within a service context, for instance, to understand the needs of service users. Different um, data sources are designed to serve particular purposes. And key sources of statistical data, of course, include censuses, um, which generally have very limited space. So questions on any given topic have to be few and short. Then population surveys, whether that's social surveys, which can include both questions for identifying disability and for understanding functioning across the population. Also disability specific surveys, which are conducted in some countries to capture more detailed information about the population of people with disability, and also surveys of particular subpopulations, for instance, prisoners. And then there's administrative data collections that capture data on either mainstream services or disability specific services or programs. And clinical registries, for instance, to capture data on people with particular health conditions or disabilities. So considering all the potential purposes of statistical data on functioning and disability, 
and the various different sources of statistical data, there's obviously huge scope for the use of ICF in statistical applications. And of course, that is what was envisaged from the outset. And in this presentation, I'll just provide a few examples of use of the ICF for particular purposes and in particular data collection contexts. So first I'll talk about data for monitoring equity and rights. So Article 31 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities requires countries to collect statistical data to inform policies to give effect to the convention and help assess implementation and identify and address barriers faced by people with disabilities in exercising their rights. And of course, countries are also required to monitor and report on implementation of the convention. For monitoring equity and rights, it's necessary to be able to identify people with disability in survey and administrative data sources so that it's possible to measure key outcomes for people with disability, for example, employment, and also to compare outcome data between people with and without disability. And of course, the ICF um, concepts, participation and environment are particularly relevant to monitoring rights and equity. So the model disability survey is very relevant to talk about in the space. It was developed by the WHO and the World Bank as a data collection tool aligned with the ICF for countries to use to collect comprehensive and comparable disability information, and particularly to support countries to implement and report on the CRPD. So the model disability survey or MDS includes questions uh, on environmental factors, functioning, capacity and health conditions, and personal assistance, assistive devices and facilitators. And there are other sections of questions on um, topics, including socio-demographic characteristics, healthcare utilization and well-being. And there's also a brief MDS, which can be integrated into health or social surveys. Functioning data from the MDS and the brief MDS can be used to generate a continuum that ranges from no disability to high levels of disability. And Jerome um, talked briefly, uh, well, talked earlier about um, the techniques for, um, for, for doing this. So you get a scale from zero to 100, and then cut points along this continuum can be used to identify people experiencing no disability or mild, moderate, or severe disability. So then it's possible to disaggregate data by level of disability. The brief MDS is um, a relatively new data collection tool, but it's been implemented in a number of countries. And there's a, um, in 2019, it was included in the world, uh, the Gallup World Poll. And there's a recent WHO publication that reports data for India, the Lao People's Democratic Republic and Tajikistan. And that report presents not only comparable disability uh, data on disability prevalence broken down by severity and demographic variables in those three countries, but also comparable data on environmental barriers that limited people's participation and a range of measures by disability status. So for example, poverty rates by severity of disability. So clearly information relevant for monitoring rights and equity and for CRPD reporting. It's instructive though to look at CRPD country reports on the UN website. Under Article 31 on statistics and data collection, relatively few countries explicitly mention ICF. Um, so based on reviewing a sample of 20 country reports spanning all six WHO regions, I found five that mentioned ICF in relation to statistics and data collection specifically. 10 mentioned use of the Washington Group short set of disability questions, which were developed with reference to ICF, but they mapped to only a few selected body function and ANP domains. And eight reports didn't mention either ICF or the Washington Group questions. Some countries report intention to use ICF as a framework for national disability data. So for example, the initial report for Colombia describes a range of initiatives underway, including National Disability um, Observatory and guidelines for harmonizing disability information in accordance with the ICF. 
Palestine's initial report mentions use of the Washington Group questions for estimating prevalence. It doesn't mention ICF, but it does say that the country's first disability survey in 2011 included data on cause of disability from a social perspective, use of aids and equipment, difficulties carrying out daily activities, um, social attitudes towards disability, degree of social integration, based on ability to use public and private transport and extent to which the environment is adapted to meet the needs of people with disability. So that suggests an ICF aligned approach to disability data collection in Palestine. Hong Kong's initial report in 2010 uh, stated that it was considering using ICF with suitable adaptation to local circumstances. Then the 2018 report stated that there have been calls for wider adoption um, of ICF in Hong Kong, and that the experience of nearby regions in applying ICF was being uh, closely monitored. And a set of questions based on ICF had been trialed in the 2013 disability survey, and another survey was planned for Hong Kong in 2019. So these are positive indications, and we may expect to see increasing reference to ICF in, um, and also other ICF-based tools like the Model Disability Survey in CRPD country reports in future. So now moving on to statistical applications of ICF to understand the experience of disability across a population to inform policy. And the 2006 Irish National Disability Survey is a good example. That survey had questions that spanned all components of the ICF. It collected extensive data on the experiences of people with disability in Ireland, including on environmental facilitators and barriers. And findings of that survey included that for adults with disability who lived in private households, nearly a quarter sometimes or always avoided doing things because of reactions of other people. Over a third had access difficulties with socialising in public venues, getting out and about in their local area and doing regular things like shopping and banking. And a lack of money was the most common reason people gave for not having adaptations they needed in their home. So this kind of rich information can inform social policy interventions, focusing on environmental facilitators and barriers, as well as policy relating to specialist disability services and supports. Now I'm going to touch on use of ICF in disability specific administrative data collections. And in Australia, the ICF ANP domains were used to develop a question to capture data on support needs for clients of disability services. And in the data collection form that you can see up on the slide there, the question was presented as a matrix with life areas based on AMP domains as rows and five response options about need for assistance and use of aids and equipment as columns. Excuse me. So these response options were actually designed to align with data captured in the National Disability Survey in Australia. So the question on support needs was completed by service providers about every client and this resulted in a rich source of data to inform disability services policy and resource allocation and service delivery and because there were common concepts relating to disability and support needs in the service data and the population survey data this meant that the two data sources could be used together to quantify met and unmet demand for disability services and a series of um, studies were done reporting on this and they were actually instrumental in demonstrating that there was a need for increased resourcing of disability services. And I want to highlight another significant piece of research that was done using the support needs data for clients with all different disabilities. And it showed that information about need for support in a subset of ANP domains can't be used to predict the need for support in other ANP domains. So effectively, it showed that in a diverse population, if you collect data based on only a few domains, then you'll miss important information about functioning and the need for support. And I do encourage you to have a read of that paper. It's very interesting analysis. 
provision of disability services in Australia has now transitioned to the National Disability Insurance Scheme or NDIS, which is quite a different model for providing disability support. And unfortunately, the disability services data collection was not transitioned across. So we've lost that continuity of data on disability services. But the legislation governing the new scheme requires that assessment tools used must, <coughs> excuse me, have reference to um, activity and areas of activity and social and economic participation identified in the ICF. And the new scheme has only been fully up and running for a couple of years now. There are lots of teething problems, but it is acknowledged um, that there's a need to improve ways of assessing people's need for supports and for measuring outcomes. And there is willingness to use the ICF as a framework. So we're optimistic that data aligned with ICF um, concepts will be developed over time. So I've talked briefly about uses of ICF in national statistics for monitoring rights and equity, understanding the experience of disability to inform policy and in disability specific administrative collections. And there are, of course, many more examples than those that I've touched on. Um, but there's certainly scope for far greater adoption of ICF based approaches in national statistics. There's scope for greater adoption of ICF in areas where work has begun, such as national censuses and surveys and disability specific data, uh, administrative data. And the review of country reports on CRPD certainly illustrates that. But then there's what might be called new frontiers where there hasn't been a lot done yet, but we would hope to see progress made in the years ahead. And so these frontiers include data on environmental factors in relation to functioning to inform um, policy about services and supports for people with disability, but also about potential environmental interventions to reduce barriers. Then there's ICF-based approaches to disability identification in mainstream administrative data collections. For example, health data, housing data. Having disability identifiers in administrative data is essential for monitoring equity of access to services. And then there's ICF-based um, approaches to capturing data on functioning and disability as health outcomes to inform health, health policy and resourcing decisions, in addition to the traditional measures of morbidity and mortality, as Jerome mentioned also. And uh, one application, of course, of this kind of data would be potentially hospital case mix funding. So this is a quote from the paper that Matilda mentioned uh, in her presentation by Ros Madden and Anita Bundy. It was titled, The ICF Has Made a Difference to Functioning and Disability Measurement and Statistics. It reported a literature review on use of ICF for measurement of functioning and related statistics when the ICF was 15 years old. The quote says, <coughs> excuse me, the ICF provides specificity and a common language in the complex world of functioning and disability and is stimulating new thinking, new applications in measurement and statistics and the assembling of new knowledge. Nevertheless, the field needs to mature, identify gaps, suggest ways to improve measurement and statistics to underpin policies, services and outcomes. And um, that is still a good summing up of the situation today at the 20 year mark for ICF. <coughs> So just some concluding thoughts from me. Having reliable and international, internationally comparable disability data is fundamental, of course. So efforts to develop and increase uptake of standard ICF-based data collection instruments like the MDS Model Disability Survey are really important. However, the ICF has broader value in statistical applications as a clearly articulated and widely endorsed conceptual structure for developing approaches for capturing data on functioning and disability designed for particular purposes and then being able to articulate how the data captured relate to other data sources and importantly to specific purposes 
sectors for which the data might be used. As well, an established use of ICF, of course, is for mapping and analysis of data sources to understand what they do and don't cover in relation to functioning and disability so that those data can be used more appropriately with their strengths and limitations uh, clearly understood. And <clears throat> finally, I just want to emphasize the importance of ongoing advocacy, which is something Ros mentioned before, to promote use of ICF in national statistical applications, including adoption of ICF-based data standards by national statistical agencies, but also broader and more flexible use of ICF as well for developing purpose-specific data, for mapping data sources, for guiding appropriate use and interpretation of data. And this will be especially important as we're moving into a new world of big linked administrative databases. So it's a long-term project and ongoing advocacy will be needed um, to ensure that the benefits of ICF for national statistics can be fully realized. I've just listed some references there if people would like to follow those up. And thank you very much. Nicola, thank you very much indeed. That was a great summary of statistical use of ICF. Um, does anyone have any questions for Nicola? Uh, I'm conscious we're running over time and I was just trying to um, see whether Dr. Berahan Oosten is joining us. But in the meantime, any questions? Last one question, Matilda here. Thank you, Nicolas. Great, great presentation. I have one question about the issue that in many countries, many governments prefer to use the uh, w the, the disability uh, Washington Group survey because, in a sense, it's easy and it captures some of disability, and that is sold as an ICF-based set of questions. I think this is an issue that is creating problem. I know that we are not here to mention this kind of controversies or other difficult issues, but how do you handle with the issue that there might be entities like the World Bank coming out with easier instruments to capture functioning and that they are selling like this and countries try to save money and they say, okay, I use that. It's easier, cheaper and so on. I mean, how did you find this or what is your thought about this? Thanks, Matilda. Yeah, I agree. That's that's um, that's an issue. And it was interesting looking at some of the country reports, um, because many of them do use the Washington Group short set, and some even cut that down further. I, I came across a couple of countries that used four out of the six questions, and you think, goodness, that's um, that's really getting quite narrow. Um, yeah, you, and I know that some countries, Australia did a comparison of the Washington Group um, questions with our national disability survey that we use for estimating disability prevalence and that really demonstrated um, that it does capture a, a narrower population of people uh, with disability. I think the same, a similar comparison was done in England. Um, in terms of how you, how you advocate for, um, for use of the, the full breadth of ICF domains, I guess that really comes down to advocacy, you know, really demonstrating that if you're using a short set of questions that only covers some domains, you're not actually capturing the whole population with disability. Or, you know, if you're, if you're measuring um, functioning uh, for, for reasons other than identifying disability, well, you're not getting a whole, the whole picture of functioning. And that just really needs to be understood by those who are making decisions. Thanks, Nicola. Has anyone else a question? We will have opportunity for some discussion at the end of this session. But the next person to speak will be Catherine, Bibiane Monteiro. Catherine, Valeria, there's Catherine. a hand raised. Yes, Valeria. Okay, I'm going to be brief, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Um, um, excuse me, but I saw the chart titled Use of ICF in Disability Services Data Collection, where we saw a part of the chart that, by the way, I loved. 
it was fantastic, okay? But there is something that I did not understand. Uh, on the left side of it, it was written, analysis demonstrated that support needs data for subset, subset of activity and participation domains cannot predict support needs in other domains. That is, it's a non-redundancy. I don't know if I understood it properly, but according to the biopsychosocial model of the ICF, all the components send and receive arrows from each or to each other. That is, if there is a problem on the activity or participation, it might be a problem on the function or on the environmental factor or even on the health condition. So how come uh, Anderson and Maiden said that the sub subset of activity and participation cannot predict support needs in other domains? I did not understand it. Did you understand my question, Nicole? Yes, I did. And thank you for the question. Um, so it was really within, within the AMP component of ICF, if you just choose a few domains like, you know, self-care, mobility, mobility, communication, and ask people, you know, maybe a couple of others and ask people about those, that subset of ANP domains, you're gonna miss some information about um, their functioning in other ANP domains. So you won't have complete picture of their functioning. And um, I, I don't know whether Ros Madden would like to say something about this um, because Ros conducted, uh, well, she's a co-author of the paper. So I might uh, hand over to Ros if that's okay, Ros. Uh, Valeria asked me to translate her uh, uh, question, and I asked her to to translate. Okay, uh, the question and the answer, if you can, Valeria. No, I think that the, the the answer might be a little difficult for me because Nicole is from a country that I am not aware with her English. If be sure a Canadian or American of might, so I ask her to speak a little slower, okay? Anyhow, a minha pergunta foi no slide ah, que estava intitulado uso da CIP na na incapaz no serviço de incapacidade nas coleções dos dados de serviço de incapacidade, né? É, aonde ela mostrou aquele quadro que, por sinal, eu achei muito bacana, é, no lado esquerdo estava escrito que os dados analisados é, mostraram que os domínios, atividade e participação não podiam é, predizer as necessidades de suporte nos outros domínios. E eu achei isso estranho, porque pelo modelo biopsicossocial da CIF, é, Todos os componentes mandam e recebem flechas né, de um ou para um do outro componente. Ou seja, se a pessoa tiver uma deficiência na, na atividade, ela pode ter um outro problema em nível de, por exemplo, função do corpo, pode levar a um outro transtorno da condição de saúde. Né? Então, eu achei estranho, porque falou que aquilo ali não, não existia. Né? Aí, é. o que... O que a Nicole falou é que parece que é, a Ross vai falar um pouco para a gente um pouco mais sobre isso agora, porque foi ela que conduziu o estudo. Aí eu vou pedir para outra pessoa me ajudar a traduzir, tá ok? Ah, Valéria, ah, eu vou falar em inglês primeiro. Look, uh, ICF domains are different from ICF components. So, uh, did you didn't you take a little um, error in the concepts? She 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 is um, she is explaining about ICF domains. So one domain cannot predict another one. She she's not she's not. Uh, speaking about the components, so your questions is about the 
uh, integrate uh, the, the components integrating. And she is not speaking about that. Uh, uh, I think that is the problem. Uh, did you did you get Bros? What I say? What I said? It might be. It might be. So uh, maybe um, I saw Ros there. Perhaps you could explain about the study. Uh, well, I think Eduardo's point is right. Um, the uh, I heard uh, Valeria say, you know, because of the biopsychosocial model, we know all those things are interrelated. Yes, we know that, but but to take that extra step and say, you know, here we are, we have nine activity and participation domains, and everything in that. ICF diagram is related to everything else. It doesn't mean you can pick out three things in one dimension and say, therefore I can predict everything else because that's actually the beauty of the model. It's saying this is complex. And to understand precisely the interrelationships, we need to be very precise about what we are doing and, and what um, we found in this analysis which was an extremely large data set as you can imagine national data um, with all those uh, and also multiple diverse um, a diverse population as very well as well as a very large one so people had many um, different types, if you like, of disability. And in such a population, you cannot, our findings were that you cannot pull out results on a few um, domains of activities and participation and seek to um, predict what might be going on elsewhere. So it was actually, um, a very nice finding in relation to the ICF itself, that those nine domains, I mean, the technical term, my colleague, my, my senior colleague was the person who, who, who did all the nice analysis, but it was really demonstrating that the nine ICF domains were distinct in that sense of looking at, you know, cut points on a spectrum, they were distinct. So it was a great um, affirmation, if you like, of the importance of those nine domains. Is that so, Valeria? Clear? So I think it's everything okay with the slide. Now, now you got. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. For yes. example, what what you said is let let's think of the chapters. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is a chapter. Uh, uh, one of the chapters that deal with, for example, mobility. We cannot say that if the person has a problem with the mobility, let's imagine a spinal cord injury person who um, uses a wheelchair, okay? He might not have a problem on his work, for example, and both of them are in the same domain. That's what they found out. Am I, am I right thinking of it? Yeah. Thinking of the com components, yes. Each of them are related to each other, but not necessarily on the same chapter. Let's imagine function or activity or the environmental factor. If a person has a problem in one of them, it might be uh, obvious that he might have a problem in, a, in another one. Is, it, is that what you mean? Okay. Okay. Catherine. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, um, Eduardo. Uh, time to move on. And we have uh, Elise Lisboa, who's co author with um, Rames and, excuse my language, Vieira Silva. <laughs> uh, so the talk on the implementation of the ICF. Uh, sorry, I've got my screens all, over, all overlapping. 
uh, in, in primary care. So, um, so Elise, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. If you share your screen. Yeah, I can. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for the great um, presentation so far. It has been very enriching. So um, not totally savvy with the computer sh screen sharing. Let me see where I can find that. Okay. Below, below your screen. I'm yeah, I, I, I think I got it. Let me see here. Okay. Okay, share. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so um, I guess I'll start here. Hmm, is it, is it working? Almost, it's so black for me. Hmm. You know what I'll, I can ask, I can ask Jaime Son to share his screen if that would work best. It's written double click to enter full screen mode, double click. But it's, it says that uh, stop sharing. So it seems to me that I'm already sharing the screen. Okay, that's okay now. Yeah. I can see. Can, can you guys see? Yeah. Oh, yes. excellent. excellent. It's a PDF, I think. It is. Uh, it's an image for our, but I cannot enlarge it for some reason. I don't know. So um, I'll try to. Elise, dá um Ctrl okay. H. Ctrl H. Ctrl H. Is that it? Uh, no, actually, you have to close this window and and, and show your slides. Uh, it's it's just the banner. The we're, we're, we don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, okay. We're just going to show okay. the banner. Okay. okay, that's okay. Excellent. So um, our uh, article talks about a study that um, was conducted translating two of the main uh, forms that are used in the primary care units uh, here in Brazil that are referred to uh, residency, uh, domicile, and uh, individual characteristics. So um, the, the main importance of the study is to um, translate or, or codify uh, proper information that are gathered in the primary care units in a more biopsychosocial uh, model format to enlarge the possibility of correlating data and creating this, this big um, data gathering place to have more proper information about all the primary uh, care units users to predict more appropriate political approaches or initiatives. So um, in in the in the digital digital scenario that we live in, it's uh, it's very uh, important to have digital charts. Um, we had those two charts, those two forms that were uh, 55 questions in one of them that were able to get 42 codes out of, referring to the individual register form. And the domicile form were 17 questions that we're, we were able to identify 12 codes, 12 ICF codes. Um, to be correlated to them. Um, the more uh, common language uh, format that the, the information is used the best for this uh, information to be 
precise to be used. Um, I, I took some notes here to make sure that I didn't forget to mention anything. So um, the primary care units are the main entry for people to get in, into the health system in Brazil. So uh, having those charts filled in with a proper, proper unified language based in ICF codes would allow us to uh, be able to correlate information from all different users. Uh, the main objective of all this is to uh, further down the road, create this uh, the pilot study with those charts to uh, instrumentalize, to train people, uh, professionals in the primary care units to the ICF language and usage. Um, those data are statistically relevant to the common base uh, pool of information for all Brazilian citizens. So the main objective is to down far the road, be able to use uh, artificial intelligence to make that correlation between codes and information, and possibly even use that through a, a app like the MICF. Uh, and we conclude that uh, the more uh, systematic and the more uh, unified uh, information that we have, the faster and the more appropriate will be the, the predictors and indicators for the users in the primary care units. So um, just a quick review here on the chart. Uh, we, we introduced the abstract, abstract saying uh, the healthcare context has been facing different disruptions, digital in the moment, because we need practically an efficient efficiency in data collection health uh, in the health public, in the public health system. So we have here just the two charts going really quick to present to you all the uh, 17 questions that were in the uh, domicile chart. Uh, yeah, the domicile chart. So uh, the questions mainly refer to uh, their residency, and we were able to correlate to 13 ICF distinct codes. And uh, the individual form were 55 questions that we were able to gather 42 uh, distinct ICF codes. Uh, we have the, the main article uh, from which this information was referred to here in the references and some other uh, good insights that we use to um, put this article together, including a study that was conducted by Eduardo back then. And uh, I wanted to thank all the uh, collaborators, all the authors in this study that were uh, Jaime Sun's group in the University of Formiga in Minas Gerais. Uh, Brazil, and uh, I guess that that's what I had to share with you guys. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Elise. Is there, there are no hands up at the moment. Okay. Can I invite any questions? No, I haven't. I, I think we can ask the questions of the three yeah. other presentations altogether. Yes. Okay. okay, okay. Should I stop thank my you. presentation then? Yes, thank you very much. All Liz. right, thank you very much. And Bibiana, are you ready to go? I can't hear. Viviana? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Ah, oh, good, good. So you're going to do two presentations? Is that correct? 
Yes. <laughs> I have just wanted. Okay, the first one is about using the ICF for elaboration of therapeutic project center on the on the individual. So oh, go ahead. I'm, with that one. Uh, first, I presentation the, the other about a qualifier to performance and capacity. Right? Okay. Oh, sorry. The second one first. Thank you. Please go ahead. It's okay. Okay. Um, use of qualifier for performance and capacity as indicator of different environments influence on the execution of activity and participation. Uh, we are in Brazil, Sao Paulo. Most instruments recommend only one measure for each activity evaluation, consider a specific context, uh, which allow for characterization of a functional condition and follow up on clinical evolution at different points. Uh, it's important to this discussions if the relation between functional level and classifier should be organized to give evidence of relevant clinical trends and the context influence, including, for example, the need for care given by third parts so that can complete. Uh, the ICF proposed that the measure of active and participation be classified more than once in different contexts in order to distinguish the performance of capacity while execution tests and, and our determinant life situation. Uh, the back of objectives propose the classification of performance and capacity in, activity, in activities evaluation by the functional independence measure, FIM, according to the score and correlation equation with the ICF to highlight the influence of different real and standardizing environment respected. Well, uh, the methods, the relation between the score and each activity evaluation by FIM was defined, considering that FIM measure has seven levels and ICF qualifiers are only five. It's important to discuss how to group two levels. Uh, to this end, the, the following criteria for this adopted score seven, complete independence, and one, complete deafness, were separate because there are functional level with a specific clinical difference and by the uh, low quantitative variation not allow it to be aggregate for the other levels. Um, consider that the score six, modified independence, indicates the need for condition to maintain independence. We consider this difference to be significant and that this should be highlighted. The remain level were grouped in the following manner. Uh, three and two, several problems considered that the person not execute this test alone. And five and four, moderate problem, the person need uh, supervision, preparation, or minimal count for this party. Uh, what's the difference? use the in case of this qualifier. And D510.1 washing when there is a need for a seat or bar so as not to fall. 
it's different for the D510.0, which perf performs the activity safely. It's possible to point all out the need for quantity and change the environment uh, factors. So I can use FIM function level seven and six with the same qualifier. And when the different when I use two qualifiers, uh, performance classification was conducted using questionnaire with a count of each individual experience in their uh, habitual environment. Classification of capacity was estimated setting based of clinical observation on the IFM text in the standardized. Uh, when I use two qualifiers, uh, here I have a situation um, uh, about the transfer on self. Uh, D420.31 when the person has capa capacity to transfer oneself in the clinic, but not in their usual environment because the height is bad is height. So I can't consider this person to be in deafness despite having the capacity uh, requiring intervention so that they can uh, achieve better functionality. The conclusion, the use of performance and capacity classifiers makes it possible to understand the setting influence on the person's functionality. It's also permits discussion of the difference between performance and capacity pre present in this each text, their life experience, which can redirect the practical according to need to resolve an individual, real, and significant problem. That's it. Thank you, Viviana. Did you want to go straight on with your second presentation? Uh, I'm sorry, repeat, uh, please. I think you, you can the... move, you can move to the next one. Ah, next okay. Okay. It's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm in the paper. Um, proposal of usual of international classification of function disability and health ICF for elaboration of therapeutic project center on on the individual. The ICF model facilitates discussion of responsibility and coordination on, of the intervention to conduct an adequate rehabilitation. Facilitating communication between the learning, the person with disability and support network. Distributing the test among the, those involved. This practice uh, facilitate establishing joint goal and allow for analysis of intervention results. Thus, it's believed that ICF multidimensional model can guard a plane of therapeutic project center of the individual. Uh, objectives to use the ICF model for discussion of a new distribution of health component to facilitate dialogue about the case among the involved and to centralize person factors to favor individual protagonism and to increase their involvement in this process. 
uh, method, we use the Steiner and collaboration in 2002 elaborated and instrument based of ICF aimed and rehabilitation problem solved forms for facilitate the discussion of the therapeutic project. All the time, they maintain the position of ICF graphic model. Uh, in this proposal, different domain of ICF was uh, applying, including internal and external factors, modifiable or not, which is the level of difficult or interferation for the each company may be graduated. Then we have the advantage of RPS forms. And this visual representation uh, facilitates the discussion. Uh, and we have a much professional integral discussion of chronic disease and clarifier goal and adjust these expectations. Uh, hi, I put the uh, RPS forms. And I, I have some uh, difference. Mm. We suggest that the new disposition, oh, sorry, uh, application RPS forms during elaboration of individual therapeutic project facilitate the understanding of rehabilitation proposal and the role of all involved. Although we consider it, it's important to highlight means by professional and family members should be not disagreed with the lead to more organic and concession discussion. Uh, we suggest the new disposition centralizing personal factors, which makes the possible great involvement of uh, protagonism by the individual, considering their biography and ideation, beliefs, preference, and expectation. Furthermore, it gives evidence of the influence of context on activity and participation with the division of activity and participation in capacity and performance. Uh, it's important to observe the disposition of capacity in the same position in the function and its structure of the body that's related of observation of, uh, of the action, which are neutral context. And they are the components that most interfer interference, it is in qualifier. While performance is in the same position as environment forms, factors, at this components, different skill in the usual environment. This distinction between capacity and performance was important to discuss this hypothesis where the person with disability performs the tax of sitting alone in the clinical and not at home, for example, allowing this professional to act more activity. These favors discussion about the influence of contextual factor in a person's life and point to our intervention needs in the environment. Yeah. Thank you, Bibiana. And I ask if there are any brief questions before we go on to the next one. We will have time for full discussion later. Um, Any immediate questions? Uh, no, I see no hands. So can I ask if, if Laurie Lati is ready to go? Laurie is going to talk about trustworthy artificial intelligence 
uh, for personalized healthcare decision making and development of open, safe measures, models, and methods. That's taking us to a new area. Hello, so, everybody. Laurie. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Laurie. We can hear you. We can't see you yet. That's nice. So th thank you for uh, attending this very interesting uh, symposium. And uh, yes. thank you for the uh, presentations and all this collaboration. It's very valuable. So uh, my presentation uh, is based on some slides. And uh, uh, before going to them, I want to briefly say that I'm a researcher uh, in Finland at Aalto University at the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm uh, collaborating with uh, representatives of uh, health. Uh, for example, in Finland, we have this uh, uh, Finnish Institute of Health and Wellbeing, uh, which is um, a governmental organization. Uh, some researchers from there, for example, have been kindly collaborating with us. Uh, uh, we are, however, doing uh, research now uh, uh, in the domain of Aalto University and in the Department of Computer Science. So uh, my slides, uh, uh, I try to put them online. So I hope I can now share them to you. Uh, can you see them or should I actually still uh, activate the slideshow? Yes, it's okay. Uh, wait a moment, uh, oops. Uh, so from the beginning. Now, I hope you can see. Can you see my slides? Yes. That's nice. Yes, thank you. So, uh, so uh, my topic uh, is um, developing uh, artificial intelligence. And as we call it in the, in the, among colleagues in the computer science, we prefer actually often the term machine lear learning. So uh, machine learning, uh, different kind of models and artificial intelligence is more like a um, more removed goal. Uh, my, um, our research project uh, tries to develop uh, models and methods that can support uh, personalized healthcare decision making uh, with trustworthy solutions that address uh, patients' rights and data privacy regulation. So basically, uh, our research uh, uh, tries to uh, find uh, answers also to these uh, very challenging privacy issues which come when we collect data and when we try to build like predictive models. Uh, already in our experiments, we uh, statistically um, uh, managed to find some significant scholar correlations with uh, our questionnaire data and some machine learning results. And I will briefly talk about them and also about these some um, aspects uh, which we hope uh, to um, promote in future research with uh, various collaborators. And you are mostly welcome, of course, uh, most welcome to uh, attend it as well. So basically, uh, the research uh, has been carried uh, already since nine, uh, 2017. And uh, it is based on a questionnaire data set. Uh, which takes lots of influence from um, previous research. And uh, we have now carried out a questionnaire which asks to um, give uh, opinions about uh, the interpretations concerning different kind of scenarios, different kind of situations people can um, face uh, in life concerning health or healthcare. And we have uh, asked them to give some ratings. Uh, it, uh, actually, this is like giving points uh, for different kind of uh, activities. And uh, you can see here one uh, example of uh, uh, expression statement that is shown in the questionnaire. I have a good health condition uh, is the state statement. And uh, the person is asked to give some rating or some points uh, in respect to the need of help. So basically, the uh, uh, questionnaire tries to get an understanding uh, how seriously people uh, feel need for help in certain uh, scenarios and uh, how this uh, uh, 
uh, differs from other scenarios and from other persons. Uh, we have also collected a lot of like background questions, uh, uh, answers to them. Um, they, they cover, for example, demographic information and life situation in general, quality of life, and uh, very importantly, uh, the health condition. We have tried to uh, gather information about the health condition, uh, let's say, uh, diagnosis and uh, care provided to this person and so on. Uh, and you can see one example question. Uh, what kind of health condition you have currently according to your opinion? And we have collected a lot of uh, data and answers from a kind uh, a collaboration uh, with uh, patients uh, and disabled people organizations and other people who have uh, contributed uh, lots of their volunteer uh, efforts and we are very thankful for that. Uh, basically, uh, our research tries to build uh, new bridges uh, between uh, traditional statistics and questionnaire uh, uh, data collection uh, and uh, machine learning or new kind of artificial intelligence, uh, which is computation about the statistical dependencies between the data. So uh, we hope that, uh, for example, in respect to this um, uh, wonderful um, framework of uh, international classification of functioning, uh, disability and uh, health, uh, uh, this uh, framework could be linked to these kind of solutions what that we are like uh, providing. So we have tried to analyze uh, what are the possibilities to link uh, statistical dependencies with some machine learning models. And you can see one illustration here trying to uh, show how we have, uh, uh, for example, answers from different groups of people uh, that differ. Uh, and uh, they differ even statistically significantly. Uh, we have these statistical results uh, first calculated. And besides that, we can make also some machine learning experiments, uh, try to check if the machine learning models we test, if they can classify uh, in a similar way the findings that we already got from the traditional statistics. Uh, and then, uh, Combining uh, these two approaches and even taking into account some random effects, we then try to make some kind of conclusions how, how these uh, different kinds of machine learnings uh, could uh, help to identify these statistical features, which have been already found uh, with the traditional methods. So we try to find uh, reliable and trustworthy machine learning approaches that can be linked to this previous uh, uh, standard processes of statistical computing. And uh, we have uh, collected uh, data uh, with different kind of uh, health scenarios. Well, they, are, they have been based on uh, both like real life scenarios and imaginary scenarios. So what if in the future there will happen something for you? Uh, can you imagine this scenario for us and how would you react then? How would you interpret this scenario in that future possible scenario? Uh, this is uh, the type of asking we try to mm, aim at. And these uh, expressions, uh, they have uh, taken a lot of influence from uh, international classification of functioning, disability and health. And besides that, also from uh, international classification of diseases, and also from this international classification of health interventions and so on. We have tried to catch uh, lots of like phrases, sentences, expressions that are used in these um, uh, standard uh, classifications. But also besides that, we have uh, captured from online discussions some frequent and uh, seemingly important uh, phrases and sentences that people use in ordinary life when, we, when they talk about their health and when they talk with other people about their health and they, when they read some information and guidance and so on. And uh, besides that, we have uh, collected background questions which try to understand uh, what kind of person is giving these uh, ratings and interpretations. So we try to ask about his life situations and uh, the health condition so that we can reflect if the way of speaking changes, if you have some uh, challenges in your life, for example, in health or disability. And uh, 
we have now uh, made an experiment specifically as a quantitative cross-sectional study uh, last year um, uh, when we tried to evaluate especially uh, coronavirus COVID-19 related uh, issues. Uh, so we had a, a collection of uh, expression statements that were related to coronavirus uh, epidemic. And we asked people to indicate uh, what is the uh, degree of uh, need for help for uh, these kind of statements. We had just uh, like 20 statements in this observation as a part of larger data collection that will be reported later. We also gathered nine background questions, uh, for example, um, concerning uh, the person's health and well being, sex, and age. And um, this was really uh, gathered, this data set, already one year ago uh, in the summertime. Uh, and uh, these uh, respondents were recruited uh, from uh, Finnish patient and disabled people's organizations, but also from uh, other health related organizations and also professionals, uh, including doctors and uh, also, uh, uh, for example, nurses. And uh, what is interesting uh, is that mm, just checking uh, uh, what was interesting uh, was to identify uh, statistically significant uh, differences between these uh, ratings concerning expression statements about uh, coronavirus epidemic. And you can see here in the table format uh, an example, which was quite surprising and actually uh, quite worrying. Uh, uh, it seemed to indicate uh, uh, in brief that uh, the people who have actually possibly a worse uh, health condition they do not necessarily indicate the need for help very loudly. So it can happen that the people who are more healthy, they are more loud when they are asking for help and indicating that they have serious problems. And this is, uh, I think, a relatively important new finding from our research with this data set and this approach that uh, actually uh, the ones who need for help, they might not be loud enough with their uh, opinions or even worse they are not heard uh, people are not taking attention to giving attention sufficiently for them so you can see here two uh, expression statements that were part of the questionnaire data set uh, uh, i suspect i suspect that i have now become infected by the coronavirus was one statement and uh, uh, the persons uh, who indicated a lower estimated health condition, they gave a lower uh, rating for the need for help, which was only like 0 0.5, uh, one, one, uh, on the scale from 0 to 1. Uh, and the persons who indicated a higher estimated health condition, they, they gave a lot of higher uh, rating for the need for help for this statement, which was uh, 0 0.5. Nine, four. And so this difference was really statistically significant. And uh, as you can see, the um, mm, population sets were uh, 263 persons for the first one and 410 for the second one, relatively big uh, uh, groups of people. And also uh, this kind of same effect happened. Um, uh, this kind of statistically significant trip difference was observed also concerning um, a question or statement, uh, I have now become infected by the coronavirus. So actually the need for help seemed to be uh, coming also now louder from the people who are more healthy. So it can happen that uh, uh, the uh, people with less uh, 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 health conditions, they, they uh, get more easily ignored because they, they might not consider their need for help as high as the healthier ones. This is important to note. Uh, uh, we, we carried out uh, machine learning experiments which uh, aim to catch uh, these statistically significant uh, differences that were observed in the uh, traditional statistics. And uh, we were happy to identify 
uh, possibilities for this uh, approach. So actually, our machine learnings uh, could uh, catch uh, partly uh, these kind of differences uh, uh, what were observed uh, with the traditional uh, statistical methods. But there's lots of work to be done uh, still. But uh, we anyway report uh, these detailed uh, results in our publication, which is now uh, in peer review and hopefully gets uh, uh, officially accepted. But it's uh, really uh, readable at the Archive.org uh, website. Uh, and uh, we aim now uh, to continue even more broadly uh, uh, collection of data and modeling of data, um, we are actually collecting uh, uh, with a large variety of exp um, expression statements, these uh, similar kind of data sets and uh, contrasting uh, them with uh, many background uh, informations uh, concerning uh, the respondents. And we aim to build uh, bridges towards uh, new kind of uh, trustworthy machine learning uh, models that can be used, for example, uh, in parallel with uh, this uh, classification framework that uh, we are now actively discussing during uh, this meeting. So international classification of functioning and disabilities and health. So uh, ICF uh, classification is very important inspiration for our work and we would like to bring our results and modeling uh, in close interaction with uh, this framework uh, we have been today talking and we would be uh, really happy uh, our research group to uh, increase uh, collaboration with you in the international community and uh, we have currently collected the data set uh, in Finnish language uh, but uh, we would be really happy to translate uh, this approach and uh, collaborate with you if you would like to be kind uh, to share some research efforts and we could write uh, shared uh, research publications of course uh, about them so i'm very uh, open for all your contacting and would be like very delighted to increase research collaboration in this uh, development of machine learning and artificial intelligence solutions related to ICF framework. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, I'm happy to hear all your valuable comments and discussions with you. Okay, well, with yeah. that invitation to join the discussions, can I ask Viviana and um, uh, Elise and Nicola uh, to be available to take part in the discussion? Thank you. Now, are there any questions, any discussion points that uh, anyone would like to raise? Uh, Laurie, can you please stop sharing, please? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just uh, stop share. Yeah, now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> Thank you. So, did you have a question, Stefanos, too? I know. Thank you so much, Laurie. And I don't have a question, but it's great work that you are doing. Uh, I think from the MICF perspective, it's also one always wonderful to, to hear what people are doing when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these things. So it'll be great to to learn more and to to read about your research. We haven't been in contact for a few years, so that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah, there was a hazed hand from Pedro in, in the other presentation. I think he wants to make questions. I can't see any hands up. Is anyone? Pedro, if, if you are there. Hello. Say hello. Uh, yeah, my question was about the second work that Bibiana presented. Uh, she showed us a framework where she put uh, in one side the body and structure, uh, body structures and body functions and environmental factors. Then they switched uh, 
activity and participation for capacity and performance and set uh, personal factors in the middle. Is that right? Did, did I get it right, Bibiana? Bibiana? Yes, uh, uh, yes, I think so. I think you are right. Mm -hmm. Well, my point is uh, when, when you do such a, a substitution of the concepts of activity and participation for capacity and performance, aren't we losing uh, uh, an individual dimension of participation that is uh, what this person uh, values about uh, her, his or her experience. I mean, participation, perhaps for me, it, it is a very subjectivity concept. And I'm not sure if we can replace this properly for performance, as performance seems to me, that is uh, 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 something that we can observe objectively. I mean, from the perspective of the healthcare provider. Does it make sense? Viviana, ele perguntou se você não acredita que a substituição de performance... Se quiser, eu posso fazer em português. Ok, não? ok. A Vânia traduz em inglês, ok? Tá. A resposta dela. Tá. Viviana, é o seguinte, quando você coloca os fatores pessoais no meio, eu achei isso bem bacana, porque realmente dá centralidade para a história de vida da pessoa e para é, a, a forma como ela lida com a vida e tudo. Mas a substituição de atividades e participação por capacidade e desempenho, é, eu fico um pouco é, pensando se, se talvez a gente não tenha, a gente não perca aí a, uma dimensão subjetiva de participação que o, que o conceito de performance não captura, já que, no meu entender, participação é, inclui uma, uma dimensão subjetiva importante né, da pessoa se sentir participante, é, se perceber como, é, como é participante mesmo de uma situação relevante para ela, e o, é, e o construto de performance parece que está mais ligado para mim de uma situação observada é, por, pelo, pela equipe assistencial, né? você observa a performance e você experimenta a participação. Então, são duas, no, no meu ponto de vista, são dois conceitos diferentes. E será que a gente não perderia essa dimensão subjetiva da participação? Quer dizer, qual que é a importância de determinada atividade para aquela pessoa? E se a performance de, da, que aquela pessoa tem em determinada atividade, para ela significa participação? Ou se para ela é, é, ela está sendo prevenida dessa participação? Né? Se para ela significa uma restrição de participação? Isso daí a gente, eu acho que é um... É um uma dimensão subjetiva que a gente não conseguiria capturar por uma observação externa, que é o que o, o, o construto da performance me parece me sugerir. Deixa eu responder em português. Uhum. É, é, porque, assim, a, o ato, é, a atividade de se vestir dentro de uma clínica é diferente de se vestir dentro da casa. Perfeito. E no centro de reabilitação, nossa discussão é justamente essa. A gente dá a capacidade da pessoa, é, para a pessoa, mas nem sempre ela acaba desempenhando isso em casa. Então, a ideia é diferenciar para poder discutir junto com o paciente e a família do porquê isso não está acontecendo. So, did you have an answer to your question? Okay, uh, actually, she, she said that the act of get rest in the clinic is different than at home, and sometimes in home you don't have the environment as in the clinic, and they need to discuss uh, with the, the caregivers what, what is the difference, why they can't do at home what they do in the clinic. 
Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. For for Bibiana, she can uh, she can see the capacity only, and she can't see the performance. For Pedro, performance is uh, provided by um, uh, an observ ob uma observação clínica. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Clinical observation. Clinical observation and not the personal uh, feeling that that's what you said that's it uh, mm -hmm. so what's correct the personal means, experience i mean yes what's correct what's wrong in this catering the difference in performance and participation is there any difference or yeah i think the central uh, theme here in my question is yes. this difference between performance and participation yes I think that's, is that a question for Bibiana? Yeah. Well, a broader question? Uh, perhaps it's a broader question. Okay, would anybody like to respond to that question? The difference between uh, performance and participation? This is, Eduardo know that this is always a question that I have. And annex two. And may I ask uh, if, if uh, this uh, kind of um, more like uh, fuzzy and uh, flexible uh, machine learning approach could assist uh, finding solutions in this kind of border cases? Because when I listened, for example, to uh, Bibiana Montero's uh, fine presentation, if I understood right, there seems to be quite often cases when it's difficult to choose a category, for example, or this kind of uh, classification. So I would like to hear uh, your points. Um, uh, do you think uh, there is a need for new kinds of uh, solutions for these border uh, cases, for example? Stefanus, would you be able to answer that in terms of uh, your MICF project and whether the machine learning would help? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's difficult um, because for most people they only function in performance. Uh, it's only in a clinical context where you work with, with ca capacity. So in, in terms of, of having patients recording or service users recording their functioning like an MICF it is it usually in real life situations um, and 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 you don't really make a difference between capacity and, and performance it's academic exercise I think often um, so so for me it's it's difficult I think if you're if you're in rehab uh, or in a clinical situation that's much more relevant um, yeah. Yeah, it's performance. It's the real life. Uh, yeah. Rosmaden, Rosmaden raised her hand. Mm. Ross, Ross has a hand up, uh, Catherine. Oh, am I not getting hands? Um, sorry, I didn't see. Would, did... Ross, Ross has a hand up, yeah. Ross had a hand up. I don't know why I didn't get hands up on my screen. Ross, if you had your hand up, would you like to take that on? Yes, please. Um, I, I, um, I think Pedro is raising a very good question. Uh, we, we had a lot of discussions about performance and participation uh, a number of years ago. And we... Um, I think our emerging view was that um, performance was something that could be measured by an external person, but participation has a definition which talks about involvement in a life situation. And we felt that you cannot measure a person's sense of involvement just by looking at them. 
So there's much more to be said, but I won't say it. <laughs> so you mean to have the performance in um, in participation categories, we have to listen to the patient. All that. Certainly. Certainly. The patient's that, that's view the only is way. Yeah. I yeah. think one could argue that sorry, performance is. Sorry, Rose, go ahead. I didn't hear exactly what Eduardo said. Can you repeat, please, Eduardo? Yes, to access to access performance in participation categories, chapter seven, eight, and nine of AP, we have to listen to the patient. This is the the only way to have this information. Is that correct for you? Well, I think one of the other points that in the discussions when ICF was developing, it was about perspectives. So that it was taking different perspectives and that of the person who is the subject of the data may be different from either a clinician observing or a proxy reporting. So it's important to take the different perspectives and I remember one of our advisors saying that you need to take the perspective of the person who's the subject of data. And the example she gave was a person with an intellectual disability who was, went shopping with a group of people with intellectual disabilities in a small bus and they all went to the shopping center and they went once a month but any one person might have a different perspective about their participation. Yes, they're participating in shopping, but not according to their wishes, which might be more than once a month. It might be to go with a family member. It might be, I'd rather walk than go in a minibus. So those personal views and impressions uh, give that person's perspective on participation. So you can have uh, a more objective view and a more subjective view, or you could call it a perspective. Does that help? Yeah, for me, it helps a lot. That's, I think that is the main point of my argument. Uh, because we, we, have to, we have to deal with this subject dimension of participation which uh, Ross just told us, uh, the concept of involvement. And this is a very subjective uh, experience. And uh, I think this is example you just gave, Catherine, is, is great because uh, a person can, can be performing such an activity and uh, for an external observer, they could say, oh, okay, he's participating, but from the perspective of the person him, himself, uh, this might not be the, the exact experience, I mean. And the contrary as well, for example, uh, a person who is uh, uh, in a wheelchair uh, conducted by a family member and who cannot, uh, for a uh, uh, cerebral palsy, for example, and this person cannot reach and get things and can barely speak, for example. But when you see the person uh, in a in a shopping and and another person, uh, a family member, for example, is doing all the job for him, is pushing pushing the chair, is getting the the things uh, and show it for that person. One could say, oh, he's greatly dependent on this other person. So this, his participation is very little, but maybe this is just what a person wants and needs. And so uh, this could mean uh, uh, perfect participation for him. Mm -hmm. yes, may, may I also still add one thing? This is very interesting discussion. 
just uh, in the context of uh, machine learning uh, experiments uh, I have been doing, uh, I'm very self-critical of the, all the challenges related to that. But uh, I would like to also mention the fact that it seems to be really challenging always to reduce dimensions, try to capture something which is the core information easily this kind of uh, condensed information loses something which is important for someone and for someone other, it might be different things. And also when trying to learn a model from some previous experiences or from experiences from other people, they might not, might not generalize well to the person now in question. So it should be very important to be very careful when trying to uh, learn something from the history, for example, because also the situation changes. And as you have mentioned, it's really big uh, um, uh, life uh, tra travel, what we all, we all face that uh, our opinions changes and uh, even the information we have provided to healthcare providers, we you know, might not agree about all of them later. And uh, so it's important to be critical for all kind of uh, machine learning results as well. Thank you, Laurie. Anyone else? Uh, um, I want to. Uh, for me, the difference of performance and capacity is important. Uh, I, to think about the environment factors, that uh, this is the the what you need to, to observe for to understand the difference. Uh, I understand that it's important to know about the satisfaction about Husla, mm -hmm. but it's different to me mm -hmm. uh, because in rehabilitation center, I need to, uh, to do a, a better performance and I need to consider it that the house and the fam that uh, that the person, and it's important to discuss uh, the the planning of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't question the uh, importance of having capacity and performance on your framework, but I, my my concern is about taking off participation of it. Maybe you should add another uh, column for specific for participation, as you have the personal factors in the center and maybe uh, at the right of capacity and performance, you have another column for participation. Uh, or the impressions of that person about what that, that performance that this person has, what this means for her. I, I use this for my passion because I, I, I question uh, if you have capacity, why you don't perform? Mm -hmm. And it's important for the passion and the family. It is mm -hmm. important to discussion. And then I difference uh, Perfect. capacity and performance for discussion. Mm -hmm. But may I ask something about it? In fact, it was something that I saw some years ago because in Brazil, there used to be a fair called Rehatec every year in Sao Paulo. So once I saw a transfemoral amputee person and he was not walking, but mobilizing, I don't know how to say that in English, sorry, with the rest of his legs. We call it in Brazil, corpo. Okay, how do you say that in, in, in English, Pedro? Any idea? Mm, I, the I rest of his sorry. leg? Okay, okay. Anyhow, so that was the way he was mobilizing. And he was fantastic on doing that. I kept lo looking Eduardo at him. Eduardo, just stop sharing. Oh. <laughs> may sorry. I, may I continue? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so he did everything that I could not imagine. That is, he was, he transferred from the floor to the wheelchair to the chair. He picked up something to show the person he was selling his stuff, you know, and anything he did, uh, he was using a prosthesis. 
So after he did so, I asked him, why don't you use your prosthesis? Why aren't there them with you? And he said, because I don't like it. I think that in fact, they do not let me do my job perfectly. However, at night, when I go out with my girl or my girl, girlfriend or anyhow, I put on the prosthesis so I can walk and go to a restaurant in order to talk to some friends. So I kept thinking, mm, so I have two moments. One moment when I, uh, I am looking at his uh, performance and another one that I am looking at his capacity. There are two scores different, different two, two, two stuff that I can think. So I kept thinking, they are different, not the same. Despite there are two on the same stuff, I mean, mobility. Did I got clear on my stuff? I don't know. There is a comment in the chat from Sonia, Sonia Maya. The issue of participation is the essence of occupational therapy profession. OT study evaluate and promote participation among all ages and populations. I think we could say that physiotherapy was the same, being a physiotherapist. And so taking that further, does anyone want to respond to the, uh, the issue really that uh, Valeria is bringing up of aggregating scores? So if you have one um, level of participation in one part of mobility and a different level of participation in another part of mobility, how would you summarize those in a single score as a mobility score? That's really a data collection issue rather than the ICF itself. You make but rules. Can I, can, I, can I say that one refers to his uh, performance and the other to his capacity? As in one, he is not using any, any external help, but on the other one, he is. Well, you've got four qualifiers. You can have, you know, activity, activity with assistance, participation, Please. participation having, with a... Having two qualifiers is already difficult. Can you imagine four? <laughs> yeah, yeah. May, may yeah. I also one thing say? Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, you have uh, lots of uh, uh, larger and longer experience uh, about uh, ICF uh, uses, but from the perspective of uh, machine learning, uh, I would be very, very happy if uh, I, for my part, could a little bit contribute, for example, uh, giving a little bit like external possibility to link uh, these concepts uh, which are currently in use, for example, in ICF. And we could perhaps see if there uh, um, exists some kind of like hidden connectivity so that when people actively use this uh, framework, uh, what might be behind the curtains happening a little bit. And uh, this might perhaps help, hopefully, in some blurry or fuzzy cases uh, to decide uh, uh, between uh, different uh, options, for example. Uh, I think um, our approach uh, might be in its early stages, but uh, the general idea highlights uh, a scale which uh, could be some kind of like um, standard scale for all the activities done in the ICF framework uh, so that they, they might uh, be uh, me measured uh, between and um, among themselves uh, with an external help from some machine learning approach. So the machine learning is just like a helper, uh, not, not trying to uh, uh, overcome or uh, substitute uh, the ICF framework, which is fantastic, but uh, hopefully we could provide some additional help for these agglomeration approaches and understanding in some unclear cases, what is the need for the patient. Thank you. Sabina, I see Hi. your hand is up. Yeah. Hi. I'll lower it first. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I 
I um, just submitted an article also together with uh, Patricia, who is not here anymore, I think. But um, and it also the discussion also resembles to the capability approach and the discussion about functionings and capabilities. So what are you able to do and what you're actually what are your possibilities are to do what you value. So there's also it seems like what Valeria was saying is also something that you there's a certain functionings that you're able to do um, but that might not necessarily also mean that it is something you value to do or not at a specific moment and um, to link that to Lowry because tomorrow I will present on uh, natural language processing as a AI technique and we are um, seeing if we can do the same technique to speech to uh, ICF so that a person themselves can elaborate on how they feel they function and link that to the ICF. But that's work in progress. I will tell more tomorrow, but I'm happy to connect with you, Lowry. Thank you. Nice to you. I'm happy for uh, this uh, collaboration. Yes. Thank you. Well, that's been a very fruitful discussion and I'd like to thank all our speakers this morning, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, this late <laughs> night for some of us in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also like to thank Eduardo particularly and all the people in Brazil who've been organizing this symposium today. And also to our translator, Vanya, who's been working in the background there. And um, I'll draw this session to a close and we'll meet again at uh, 1700 GMT. I will be handing over the chairing to uh, Eduardo and going to my bed. Mm. <laughs> so it's four o'clock in the morning, there's no time to be working and I wouldn't function very well. So again, thank you particularly to all our speakers. I think the discussions have been very interesting and we'll see everybody in the next session, except for those of us who are going to bed. So thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Eduardo. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye-bye. Thanks.